Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 3 of what if I was reincarnated into the MHA world and awakened the Sharingan. Let the tale begin. Chapter 41 Midterm Exam Key POV After that locker room incident, we all decided to put that behind us. Anyway, May has just ended, which means that the summer holiday will start soon. But before that, we need to face one of the biggest challenges in every student's life. Dun 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 then. The Summer Midterm Exam I hope you have all been studying the midterm exam is upon you all. This exam will determine whether you will attend the UA Summer Training Camp, Aizawa Sensei said before leaving the classroom. As soon as he left the class turned into utter chaos. Ah, uh, what do I do? I haven't studied at all. Kaminari yelled. We all agreed with his words. With all the things that went on this term we haven't got much time to study. Luckily for me, with my trusty Sharingan, remembering information was a simple matter. Download app I'm amazing that way. A slash n. Pretty sure Sharingan can do that. I check online it said that it was hinted that was one of the abilities but was never pointed out, Kichan. Mina said with a teary-eyed expression. Please help me. She muttered as she grasped my shoulders. Jiro Kaminari Jiro, and Siro asked me as well and I agreed on helping them study. Two weeks later. Today's the day of the written exam, I have been tutoring my friends for the past two weeks, and I smiled when I recalled what happened. Flashbacks start, and that's all of it. I announced and closed my textbook and stared at me students. I have gained permission of using our classroom to teach my friends during the weekends. Thanks, Adan. Kaminari said with a tired tone from all the studying. No problem. I responded. But Kichan, you've spent all your time teaching us, you haven't studied for the exam, Mina pointed out. The others also look at the ground with guilt and shame. Don't worry, guys. I can just do this. I happily declared as I picked up the textbook. I activated my Sharingan and quickly flipped through it. After discovering this broken method, I may have been abusing it. Well, because of that, I won't get a big migraine anymore, as my brain's processing skills got better. Done. With my quirk. I can remember everything. I said with a bright smile and went through all of the books. Wait, hold on, that's impossible, right? Let's see, what does page 57 talk about? Jiro questioned. I easily answered and this went back and forth before they finally believed me. They all stared at me with a deadpan expressions. Life's not fair, Mina said as she lay face down on her desk. Flashback and in conclusion, the writing part of the exam was very simple. What I'm looking forward to was the practical part. My friends thanked me for my efforts. Mina told me that because of my tutoring, she didn't leave anything blank. I feel giddy knowing that my friends passed the test because of me. When the written exam finished, Aizawa Sensei told us that the practical version of the exam will start in three days. Three days later, we were gathered in front of all the UA teachers. Principal Nizu was at the front and he congratulated us on the written exam. He then explains the concept of our practical exam. In short, we will be formed into teams of two and we will be fighting our teachers. We can win by either escaping through the gate or defeating the teachers and putting them in specially made handcuffs. I wonder who I will get teamed up with. Keat pondered. Thirp of currently, Shoto's mind was in turmoil. This is going to be a drag. He thought as he felt a finger keep poking his face. You ha anyone home? Keith said as she kept poking him. Shoto sighed before nodding. They will be fighting Shota Aizawa in this exam, and he felt nervous. They were led to a neighborhood-type battlefield with rows and rows of houses and streets. The practical exam will now be starting. A robotic voice sounded as soon as they got to the starting line immediately. Keed and Shoto sprinted towards the exit gate. They determined that it was best not to fight with their sensei, and as long as one of them escaped, they win. Give of Todoroki and I sneaked from the alleyway and alleyway. Eventually, we spotted the gate and we ran toward it at great speed. Suddenly, Aizawa Sensei landed in front of us. Todoroki was going to send ice toward him but was surprised that nothing came out. I also tried to activate my jutsu and I found out that it was not working. I sensed that I can't manipulate my own chakra anymore and I visibly slow down. A slash N. Aizawa's eraser quirk doesn't work with mutant type quirks. Todoroki Kuen Go. I will buy you time. I shouted as I charged at Aizawa Sensei. Todoroki shook his head and stood next to me. Like I said last time, I won't leave my friend. 
he said with determination as he get into a fighting stance. I nodded and subconsciously touched the pouch attached to the left of my waist. That's where my kanai were stored. With a quick action, I launched projectiles and Aizawa Sensei blocked with his scarf. When he pulled his scarf down, I was already before his eyes and unleashed a punch. Sensei dodged and I pursued him. He hurled his scarf at me and with a swift motion, I unsheathed my katana. I slashed in a crescent motion and frowned. Instead of cutting the scarf into pieces, the scarf stretched and overlapped with my blade and wrapping around it. Sensei pulled on his scarf and I pulled back. Without my churka, I'm slowly loosing the tug of war, and I was impressed by Aizawa Sensei's strength. Achiha! Todoroki shouted and he manages to sneak behind Aizawa Sensei. An ice wall formed between Sensei and I, breaking my sword free from his restraint. Aizawa swung around and Todoroki instantly lose his quirk. However, with the opportunity Todoroki gave to me, I smashed through the wall with Rasengan. Aizawa glared at me and my Rasengan suddenly dissipated. However, I expected something like this and immediately changed my stance into a high kick. Aizawa took a step back and my foot narrowly missed his face. I recovered from the kick and pounced, not leaving Aizawa-sensei alone. Go now Todoroki-kun. Todoroki reluctantly nodded and serpented towards the exit gate. Suddenly he. Frozen and I frowned. Aizawa have his scarf wrapped around Todoroki's ankle and was stopping him from moving. However, by doing so, his eyes were momentarily turned away from me and that moment was all I need. Chidori. I gathered lighting into my hand and a strange airy sound resounded through the arena. I brought the Chidori close to Aizawa Sensei's face. Take this. He was stunned by my attack and he was blinded by the white flashing light. I yanked on Sensei's scarf and pulled with all my strength. Todoroki escaped by Aizawa Sensei's restraints, and I begun to swing Aizawa Sensei into the air. With my chakra strength, Aizawa Sensei flew so high. However, he flicked his wrist and the scarf whipped towards me like a snake. The scarf latched onto to my wrist and I was pulled along with him. I unsheathed my tanto and furiously stabbed at the scarf. I scraped desperately and finally the fabric loosened. Unfortunately, there was one fatal flaw in my plan. Gravity took in and I began to free fall. Wind brushes against my ear and the distance between me, and the ground was getting closer I closed my eyes bracing for impact but suddenly I felt someone grab me and stop my fall. I opened my eyes and saw Todoroki Princess carrying me. He creates a path with his ice as he slides toward the gate. To Todoroki-ka. I stuttered and my face felt slightly hot. Aizawa-sensei can no longer go after us as he's still in the air and have to use his scarf to land safely. I was relieved that I did fall and hurt myself. Todoroki held me tightly and I felt awkward. I gazed at his eyes without the scar on the left side of his face and he was really handsome. Are you all right? Todoroki asked I nodded and together we skid through the finish line a robotic voice sound. Shoto Todoroki and Kid Uchiha passed. Todoroki stepped off the icy path and sighed in relief. Um, todoroki cut. You can put me down now. I muttered as the small blush still remains. Realizing that he was still holding me. His eyes widened and he gently put me down. Thanks. I sat quietly and he nodded. We slowly made our way back, and during the walk we didn't say anything to each other. I'm still embarrassed so I'm not in the condition to make any small talk. When Todoroki and I arrived, Recovery Girl greeted us. She told us that the others were still taking their exams in other areas. Todoroki and I watched the big screen, but occasionally I recalled what happened as my face slowly becomes red again. Eventually, I managed to put that thought away, however. Weirdly enough during that moment I felt a weird feeling. It was only for a moment and that confuses me even more. Soon after my exam finished, the rest of my friends arrived. Unfortunately, Kirishima, Carminari, Mina and Sato failed their practical exam. They were crestfallen and I tried my best to cheer them up. Midoriya and Bakugo teamed up and just like in the original show, they fought with all might. The battle was pretty insane to watch as Midoriya and Bakugo were forced to work together to pass the test. Once everyone's exam ended, Aizawa Sensei came in and told us that the people who failed will still participate in the training camp since everybody passed their written exam. They will just have harsher training than the rest of us. They were delighted to know that they can still attend the camp but their face paled at the thought of harsh training. Now that the midterm exam has ended, 
means that the holiday starts now. We all celebrate it at the thought of a vacation. Chapter 42 Summer Festival The of weeks later. Some time passed after the final exam, and I spent my time training and continue recreating the Demon Slayer manga. I hung out with Ochako and Mina occasionally. We also practice together in the school gymnasium. Even if it's the holiday, UA still gives access to the facilities as long as we're a student there and we have to ask for permission in advance. However, I am going to put my normal routine on hold because the summer festival in Mizutafu will start soon. I excitedly lay on my soft bed and picked up my phone. Kidachiha. Hi guys, the summer festival is upon us. Let us all go together as a class. Mina Ashido, wow, that sounds like fun. I will come. Tenya Ida. Very well, I will attend. Ijiro Kirishima. Flexing muscle. Ochako Yuraka. Sure. Izuka Midoriya. But Uchiha chan, don't we have to prepare for the training camp? Kidachiha. We all have been working hard, so I think it's best to relax once in a while. Denki Kaminari. Yeah, Midorigan, don't be so tense every time. Shoto Todoroki, will. Go. Izuka Midoriya. If you say so, Kaminari kuen. Okay, I will be there. 11 plus more messages. A slash n. Bakugo wasn't in the chat since he didn't join. I was happy to know that almost all my friends will attend. I gave them the information about where we will meet. A few days later, evening. I arrived at the entrance and met up with Ochako. We were the first two here. Ochako stared at me with sparkling eyes. Keed, you look so pretty. My current outfit was a black kimono with red flowery patterns. I have a gold rose hair braid, and my hair was tied into a bun. Ochako-chan also looked very pretty as well. Ochako chuckled. But compared to yours, mine looked cheap. Not at all. I denied. She was wearing a simple pink kimono without any patterns. However, in my opinion, Ochako's simple style made her look very cute. MHA World was around 300 years ahead of my original world, and thankfully they still kept the traditional Japanese culture, and I was very grateful for it. Therpio Ochako and Ki talked with each other for a couple of minutes until everyone finally arrived. All the girls wore their kimonos, while the boys wore casual clothes. Ki couldn't wait any longer, and she dragged her friends through the entrance. Minachan, let's play this. Ochako-chan, let's try that out. Keith said with excitement and brought everyone around the festival. Mina and Ochako have spent a lot of time with Keith, so they know about her childlike curiosity and unlimited energy, so they have gotten used to it. Everyone else, though, was shocked to see her act like this, but they all thought it was funny. All in all, they had a wonderful time. They tried many delicious foods and street games. Keat got herself banned from all the throwing-type game stalls because of her shuriken slash kanai skills. She could easily hit a bull's eyes and win the best rewards. That night, Keat had made many street vendors cry. But luckily, she rejected the big prizes and decided to choose the smaller ones as she felt guilty. When she told them this, the vendors shed tears of happiness. During their exploration, Keat spotted a big awesome parade. She brought everyone to watch it. But unfortunately, that was a mistake as a gigantic crowd scattered their group and brought each of them to a different area of the festival. Where is everyone? Keed muttered. She looked at her phone while frowning. Each of her friends sent a message about their location, but it was still pointless. Keed decided to wander around and hopefully meet one of her classmates. After 10 minutes of walking, she started to lose hope, and suddenly someone grabbed her wrist. Ah, Todoroki. Keed said with surprise as she turned around and saw Shoto. Keed was glad that she was able to find someone. Shoto let go of her and led the way while she followed close behind him. Together, they started looking for more of their friends. The class has decided to meet each other at the fireworks watching place. They continued to make their way. Shoto realized that Keed hadn't said anything in a while. Knowing her personality, he finds it strange. He turned around and found that Keed was gone. His eyes widened and Shoto quickly went back the way he had come. He spotted Keed observing at a stall that sells small accessories. Shoto got close and noticed that she was staring at a bracelet with designs of small, cute pink flowers. How much is that one? Shoto asked the shopkeeper out of the blue. He buying it for this young lady? The shopkeeper said with a smirk. Why? No need, I got my own money. Keed said and brought out the small wallet in her purse. 
No, as you said, this is just repaying the favor, Shoto replied. What favor? Keed asked. She was very confused as Shoto never owned her anything. That day, with the hero killer, you saved our lives. This is the least I can do, Shoto answered, because that's what friends are for. Don't worry, I will buy it. Just let the boy buy it for you, the shopkeeper insisted. Before Keed could argue further, Shoto had already bought the bracelet and handed it to her. Keed giggled and glanced at the bracelet in her palm. Todoroki-kun, since you bought it for me, shouldn't you put it on? She teased. Shoto paused and stared at the bracelet in her hand. To Keed's surprise, Shoto hesitantly reached for the bracelet and tied it around her slender wrist. Keed was surprised and Shoto gently grabbed her hand, not wanting her to wander off again. Shoto didn't look back and continued marching so Keed couldn't see the blush on his face. His body was numb, and all he could feel was his fingers enclosing Keed's small, soft hand. Keed stared at Shoto's back while being led away. She glanced at the bracelet on her wrist and the strange feeling returned, however this time it stayed a little bit longer than before. They finally reached the location to view the fireworks, it was a big plain grassy hill, and there were already other people there with picnic blankets. Their friends weren't there yet, so they decided to take a seat where there weren't a lot of people. Thank you for this gift, Todoroki-kun, Keed smiled brightly. Shoto's face became red again, and he just nodded while averting his gaze. You okay, Todoroki-kun? Keed asked seeing his heated face. Your face looked really red, do you have a fever? Before Shoto could respond, Keed leaned closer and pressed her forehead against his. Ba-dump, ba-dump, ba-dump. Shoto felt his heart beating faster and faster. Keed frowned. Your forehead felt really hot. Are you really all right? He gently pushed Keed away. I, I'm really fine. Okay, if you say so. Keed muttered worriedly. Boom, suddenly, their conversation was cut short, and they glanced at the dark sky where a majestic display of fireworks was exploding in clouds. It's beautiful, isn't it? Keed said as she watched with awe, her eyes sparkling like stars. Yes, Shoto replied. However, his eyes weren't on the fireworks but on the face of the girl sitting next to him. This is where you guys are, and we've been looking for you two everywhere. Keep if I turned my head and saw Mina and the rest of my friends walking toward us. I went to greet them and sit with the rest of the girls to watch the majority of the show. By the end of it, we decided to call it a night as it was already pretty late. Today was an enjoyable day. And I hope we can continue to hang out like this in the future. Next day. I woke up and got off my bed. I walked to my desk and saw the bracelet Todoroki bought for me. I held it close and felt my face slightly heat up. I shook my head, and the feeling vanished, I put it on my wrist before downstairs. My family was having breakfast so I went and sat at my spot. How's yesterday? Mom asked. Yesterday was so fun. My friend bought this cute bracelet for me. I said as I showed my family Todoroki's gift on my wrist. Let me guess, was it a boy? Mom questioned. I nodded and giggled, remembering what had happened yesterday. I can feel my face slightly heat up again. Snap two times. Mom and I glanced at where the sound came from. Oniai-chan and Dad were sitting at the dining table, and it seemed like their chopsticks broke for some reason. Our Itachi seems like our utensils were getting pretty old and brittle now. We may have to get new ones, Dad muttered and Itachana nodded. Oniachan then picked up the cup of tea beside him. By the way, Keed, what's this friend's name? Itachi Oniai-chan asked. Ah, uh, his name is Shoto Todoroki. Somehow, cracks appeared on the teacup that Oniai-chan was holding. Father, I think we may have to replace our cups as well. We also seem to need to throw away a piece of trash. Itachi Oniai-chan said with a cheery tone. Yes, you're right, Itachi. Dad forcibly smiled. Mom furrowed her eyebrows as she looked at the two of them while I was watching with confusion. Third POV, during the summer festival. While Class 1A was having fun at the festival, darkness was gradually gathering strength. Located in the Kamino Ward, many villains were gathering in a rundown bar. Is this everyone? Shigaraki questioned as he observed the group of strange-looking people in front of him. We're waiting for one more, Shigaraki-sama. Kurajiri said behind the bar counter. What's the holdup? I want to kill someone already. A bulky man with blonde hair and a prosthetic eye whined. Patient, muscular. 
A man wearing a gray and black bodysuit reasoned. As soon as he responded, the group of villains heard the sound of footsteps. The door swung open, and what stood at the entranceway was a figure wearing a black cloak and a white theater mask that formed a smile-wide grin spreading across his face. The man walked forward, but Muscular stopped in front of him. Who the fuck do you think you are wasting my time? Muscular said, his voice full of hostility as he pushed the man in the shoulder. However, as soon as Muscular touched him, instantly five human-sized mannequins with blades pressed their weapons on all of Muscular's vital points. Muscular gulped and he slowly backed away. Shigaraki watched the scene with a hint of amusement in his eyes. I welcome, Kagutsu. Kurajiri announced as Kagutsu snapped his fingers, and the mannequins moved away from Muscular's body and disappeared into the shadows. He then continued walking towards the group, leaving the stunned Muscular back at the entrance. Now that everyone's here, let's start the plan. Shigaraki said as all eyes focused back on him. Chapter 43 Start of Training Camp Keed POV Have you prepared for everything, Keed? Mom asked with concern. Yep, I have checked three times. I responded and brought my luggage to the front door. Today's the day of the start of my training camp. I wore my standard UA uniform and we will meet at the school. A bus will then take us to the location of the camp. Class 1B will also join the camp. I was excited about that. I mean, the more people, the merrier. I'll wait before you go. Itachioni Aichan suddenly called out. He took out a small leather satchel with straps and handed it to me. There are some storage scrolls in there that can help you in the camp, Oni Aichan said. I nodded and happily slung the little bag over my shoulder. It wasn't until recently I discovered that there were sealing scrolls here. To make one, a special tree that was a very good conductor with Cherka was needed to make the paper. Once made, we infuse our own chakra into the paper while placing the item we want to store on top. The process was draining and needed a high amount of chakra for the job. Just by looking at the number of scrolls in the bag, Oniai-chan must have spent a lot of his time on this and I felt extremely grateful. I happily slung the little bag over my shoulder. I gave my family a final farewell before walking out of the house and making my way toward UA. Once there I greeted my classmates and liked the good class representative that I was. I did a roll call while they were getting on the bus. The journey was pretty normal and we all just talk about what we would expect in the camp. After an hour of driving, we finally stopped at a cliff area. Everyone was pretty confused at the random stop. Suddenly a black car parked next to us. The car door opened and two women jumped out. One of the ladies has dark red hair, a red skirt, and boots while the other one has blonde hair wearing the same matching outfit, but it's colored light blue. Both of them were wearing large white gloves that looked like the paws of a cat. These two are the pro heroes that will work with us during the training camp. The Pussycats. The blonde one here was Pixie Bob, and the one with red hair was Mandalay. Aizawa Sensei introduced them. Midoriya got very excited and told us about their feet. He then explained that this year will be their 12 years of working as a pro hero. However, before he can finish, Pixie Bob grabbed him by the head and said in a threatening voice, We're 18 at heart. She turned her attention to the rest of us and we all quickly nodded. Mandalay then went to the railing at the edge of the cliff and pointed at the far distance. That's where the camp will be, and you will run there starting from now. Eh! We all yelled in shock. Achiha! Ida called out, knowing what he meant. I activated my Sharingan and looked at where Mandalay was pointing. I can just see the campsite but it's really far, I answered. Hearing this my friends gulped and they were all aware of what my eyes can do if I say that it was far I really meant it. Immediately, all of us ran toward the bus. However, Pixie Bob got between us and summoned a huge wave made of mud. Out of reflex and habit, I leaped high into the air to dodge the tsunami of mud and safely landed back on the ground. I saw the rest of my friends get swept off the cliff by the mud wave and my face paled. A Pixie Bob, you missed one, Mandalay said and pointed at me. Both of them have evil smiles. I looked at Aizawa Sensei with puppy dog eyes, but he just turned around and walked back to the bus. Please spare me. I pleaded and I direct my puppy eyes onto the two heroes. Sadly, Mandalay didn't say anything and just gestured for me to get down there as well. My shoulders slumped and I slowly walked to the edge and leaped. I took out my secretly stored kunai and used it to slide down the cliff. Once on the ground, in front of me was a giant forest. I entered and heard the sound of battling. 
I saw my class working together taking out a group of monsters made of mud and rocks. I only have my kunai on me while the rest of my gear was on the bus and my kunai probably won't do much damage. But wait, before I left, Itachuniachan handed me a few scrolls, I opened my satchel and looked through all of the scrolls. On the scroll it said the word kanabu. I laid the scroll on the ground and spread it open. I did a few hand signs and slammed my hand onto the center of the scroll as I inject my chakra into it. A weapon appeared at the center of the scroll. The weapon was a wooden mace with a long handle. There were metal studs protruding out of the head of the mace. It looked like a very heavy weapon, but thanks to my chakra manipulation I can easily carry it and even use it with one hand. I picked it up and did some test swings. I thanked my Oniai-chan in my heart. I looked towards the sound of battling and a wide smile appeared on my face. Therpiovi currently class 1A was working as a team taking out the mud golems. Mina used her acid to melt their legs. Shoto froze them with his ice. Izuku and Ijiro punched the monsters to pieces and Katsuki shattered the beasts with explosions. But there were too many of them and the class was getting pushed back. Suddenly a gigantic mud beast bigger than the rest appeared before them. It roared and they looked at it with panicked expressions. Fortunately, a slim figure was seen jumping toward the huge creature. It's Kichan. Ochako yelled with relief. At the start they can't find her and they all got worried but they don't have the time to search for her as they were immediately attacked by the monsters. She swung her kanabu, aiming at the thing's head. The head of the beast exploded into pieces and fell to the ground. Keed stood on top of the monstrosity and said with a cheerful tone, Sorry for being late guys. Let's show them the power of Class 1A. Keed yelled as she raised the mace into the air. The class was motivated by her words. With the help of Keed, they managed to travel at a faster pace and reached the campsite by the late afternoon. The class looked like they have just gone through hell, Pixie Bob and Mandalay laugh seeing their condition. Keep POV we finally reached the campsite. I saw Mandalay and Pixie Bob standing in front of us and laughing. All my friends were exhausted I however was the opposite. I quickly arrived at the two heroes. Again. I yelled with excitement. It's so much fun. I was able to smash things with a giant hammer, who would consider that boring? Both of them gave me weird looks and said that I can do it again next time. Anyway, there was one weird thing I found among the scrolls. I wrote, for Shoto Todoroki. So I should give this to Todoroki? I shrugged, since it's my Oniai-chan it won't be anything bad, right? We went inside the camp building and have a massive dinner to refill our energies. When we finished stuffing our stomachs I went to find Todoroki. Todoroki-kun, wait. I said and approached him. What is it? He asked. My Oniai-chan wanted to give you something. I said and pulled out my scroll and do the standard summoning jutsu. A box appeared and I handed it to him. All right, see ya. I said and went with the girls to our own room. Therp of a few hours later in the boys' lounge room. Hey, Todoroki-san, what's that? Izuku asked. Uchiha-chan's brother wanted to hand this to me. Shoto responded. This caught the attention of the rest of the boys as they gathered around him. Wow, the infamous Red Crow gave you something. That's awesome, quickly shows us what's inside. Denki said with excitement, the rest of the guys also nodded. Okay. Shoto said as he sat on the ground and his friends sat in a circle around him. He set the box on the floor and slowly opened it. He quickly leaned backward as a single kunai shot out of the box. The kunai embedded itself in the wall right behind Shoto. If he hesitated for a second, that kunai would have hit him in the face. They looked at Shoto with a shocked expression. Hanta shakily stood up and took the kunai off the wall. Todoroki kun, what did you do to piss off Red Crow? All the boys shouted with confusion and fear. Meanwhile, in the Uchiha residence, Tiske missed Itachi clicked his teeth. He sent his crow to watch if the trap worked, but unfortunately, it didn't. Nice try, my son, we just have to work harder to succeed. Fugaka said as he patted Itachi's shoulder hearing this Mikoto looked at the two suspiciously. Chapter 44 Camp Training Key POV I woke up feeling refreshed. The bed was more comfortable than you would expect from a camp. It was still pretty early as everyone was still in bed. I quietly got up, brushed my teeth, changed my clothes and went outside. I took a deep breath of the fresh air. Seeing that there was still some time before breakfast, I decided to practice with my weapons. 
I walked to a random cliffside and took out all the weapon scrolls I have and summoned them all. I looked at all the weapons on the floor before finally picking up a katana. It just looks like a normal sword with a black handle and circular guard. I'm starting to like the katana more and more. I plan to wield both a katana and a tanto to give me more flexibility. I held it with my two hands and got into a stance, I raised my katana and swung my blade. After getting comfortable with swinging the blade, I then changed my stance and sliced the air with a different motion from before. I continued this routine for a while before switching to a different weapon and repeating the same thing. Some time has gone by and I felt a presence watching me. I turned my head and noticed a small boy with black spiking hair, wearing a red cap with two spike horns coming out of it. He was staring at me with a cold look. That must be Koda. I thought to myself I didn't see him on the first day so I don't get a chance to greet him. I wiped the sweat off my head and walked toward him with a smile. Hi, my name's Kidachiha. What's yours? I happily introduced myself as I held out my hand. He looked at my hand before slapping it away. I already know his personality so I wasn't surprised by his action. This is my hideout, leave. He said with an angered tone. Uh, sorry about that little guy. I said. My name is Koda, get it right? Also, breakfast is ready. What? I yelped in surprise, I must have been training longer than I thought. I thanked Koda and patted his head before gathering all my weapons and running back to camp. Aizawa-sensei was standing at the entrance of the dormitory. He saw me and said, Uchiha, what are you doing out in the forest? Sorry, sensei. I've been doing some morning training and I wasn't aware of the time. I answered. He nodded. Very well. Go change to your sports uniform and have breakfast with the rest of the class. I speedily went to have a shower and come back in my sports uniform. I went to sit with my friends and ate breakfast in a hurry. My meal disappeared in a blink of an eye. I must have been hungrier than I thought. During our breakfast, I spotted Todoroki and went toward him. Good morning, Todoroki-kun. May I ask what did my Oniai-chan gave you? I asked with curiosity. For some reason, his face paled. It's nothing interesting. He replied. Not wanting to pressure him further, I shrugged my shoulders and returned to my seat. Soon Aizawa sensei came in and told us to meet him outside. When we got outside, he explained that we will be improving our quirks. Aizawa sensei gestured for us to follow him, and we went deep into the woods. We reached an open area surrounded by trees. There was a giant piece of rock at the center like a small mountain. He then told each and one of us to train our quirks as Aizawa sensei, and the pussycat set up an area specifically for them. All my friends went to their designated location and I was the last one. Uchiha, unfortunately, I can't help you with your training, but I believe you already got something in mind. Yes, I already planned out what I should achieve in this camp. I answered. He nodded, follow me. Aizawa sensei then led me to a secluded area. It was an open flatland surrounded by trees, just perfect for what I was doing. I will be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed that he doesn't have a method of training for me. However, I have planned out at home what I should try and achieve in this camp. The villains will attack again. I need to get as strong as possible with the time I was given. I sat in the center of the field and entered a meditative position. For now, I wanted to recreate a lightning release that will help me greatly. The lightning chakra mode. A slash in. Gonna apologize in advance if I somehow offend any hardcore Naruto fans out there. My speed, agility, and power were okay for now, but what I'm lacking in defense. If I get hit directly even once, I shuddered and remembered my battle with the USJ Nomu. Since I don't want to get hurt, I shall max out my defense. I calmed my breathing and started manipulating my chakra to wrap around my outer body. Even if I master chakra control, it still took some time for me to surround the chakra with my entire body. I have never done it before, the most I have ever done was wrapping chakra around my limbs or weapons. Therefore, I need to distribute my chakra evenly to get the best results. I then apply my lightning element and I felt static electricity on my skin. I opened my eyes and saw that my entire body was covered by a blue aura with faint sounds of electricity crackling. Wow! I exclaimed in excitement but the lightning chakra mode immediately disappeared. I wasn't saddened by it and attempted to redo the process. When I tried again, the time for me to cover my body with chakra was much shorter, and I slowly stood up while concentrating on covering my body with my chakra. Kagebunshin no jutsu. 
Another Keed appeared in front of me. Both of us nodded and I handed Keed number two a kanai. She then attacks me while I kept my lightning chakra mode activated. Clang! The kanai strikes my body but it bounced off my skin. My eyes widened and now my defense was maxed out. For the rest of the day, Keed number two continued to attack me with all sorts of methods. Turns out that if I sustain too much damage, my lightning chakra mode will be destroyed. I realized I can't be in lightning chakra mode for long, so I have to be smart about when to use it. I also figured out that by being in that phase, I got naturally faster and stronger. This can probably give me a sudden boost of speed to catch my opponents off guard. But it still took me a bit of time and concentration to use this new ability, so training my activation time will be my main priority. Chapter 45 Hot Spring Incident Keep POV I have been training for the entire afternoon and I got pretty tired from using so much stamina, but I easily recovered by just eating dinner. Oh yeah, Class 1B has finally arrived and they also started their own training. I'm in the natural outdoor hot spring, which the pussycats gave us permission to use to reward us for our hard effort. In the hot spring, I catch up with all my friends in Class 1B, as I haven't talked to them in a while. After talking, I went back to my original spot. It's bliss. I thought to myself and lay in the warm hot water. However, I don't know why, I felt like I need to watch out for something. Third POV while the girls were bathing on the boys' side. The guys were also enjoying themselves in the hot spring. But there was one purple hair midget standing next to a big wall with a towel on his waist. Yo, my netisan, what are you doing? Dinky asked. The other side was the girls' hot spring he said with a crazed expression. The boys in class 1B gave him bored looks and they have already gotten used to his perverted personality. The boys in class 1A, however, started shaking uncontrollably as Minoru Mineta has just reawakened their past trauma. I'm not gonna let a wall stop me, he yelled, as he pulled off a dark purple ball of hair from his head and stick it to the wall. I think I have bathed enough, Fumikic said as he got up and wrapped his towel around his waist, the rest of the boys in class 1A nodded and they all stood up. Even Denki agreed that no matter how dumb he was, he will never make the same mistake twice and left as well. Soon class 1A all left and the boys in class 1B just shrugged, they thought that class 1A was just weird. They watched Minoru with amusement and he speedily climbed up the wall with his quirk. As he was about to reach the top he got knocked back down. Standing on the top was Koda with a long wooden stick. Like that's gonna stop me. Minoru yelled as he increased his climbing speed. This continued for a while before Minoru went to plan B. He went to Tetsutetsu and said, Hey Tetsutetsu-san, have you heard what that red-haired boy in class 1 has said about you? Minoru commented in a casual tone. Huh. Tetsutetsu got all confused. He said how you're very weak and that he easily beat you in the UA Sports Festival. The guy then said you probably can't even break that wooden wall right there. Minoru said while pointing at the divider between the two hot springs. Everyone caught on to what Minoru was doing, and they all tried to calm Tetsutetsu down but he was too hot-headed, and he immediately got up in rage and charged at the wall. Tetsutetsu activated his quirk and bust straight through. A slash N. Just imagine the armored titan breaking through the wall in AOT on the first episode. Tetsutetsu suddenly heard many screams and he looked in front of him and his face paled. He just realized what he had done. Fortunately, the girls quickly covered their bodies with their towels, but it was still barely enough as the water just made the towels stick to their skin, revealing their curves. Minoru and the rest of the Class 1B boys peeked through the hole with a nosebleed. Ah, that's why. My instincts never lied to me before. All the boys heard a soft gentle tone and Keed walked to the front. Her Sharingan was spinning rapidly, and this time there was a demonic feel to it. Keed cracked her fists and showed them her signature smile. Before Tetsutetsu could say anything, Keed punched him right in the stomach with her fist. He bent down from the pain and Keed immediately grabbed his head and smashed it to the ground. Tetsutetsu became limp and was instantly defeated. One down. Eleven to go. Keed muttered and she observed the boys like a predator spotting its prey. Immediately, every boy in the hot spring started sprinting for their locker room, they quickly grabbed their clothes before running away. One of the pussycats, Ragdoll who heard the commotion arrived in front of the girls. Hey what's going on here? She asked. He didn't say anything but just pointed at the giant man-made hole and the unconscious Tetsutetsu. 
Ragdoll put two and two together and her usual cheery expression turned dark real fast. Five in the cafeteria, three at the 1B male dorm, two have run outside and the last one was at the 1A male dorm. Ragdoll said as she activated her search key nodded and she calmly walked to the girls' locker room and put on her own sets of clothes. She said with a cold expression, Let the hunt begin. Sometime later. Someone help. Minoru runs through the hallway of Class 1A's male dorm. He knocked on all the doors but they were all locked and nobody dared to open them. His fear grows as he can hear screaming in the distance and the sound of fists punching flesh. Minoru reached the last door, Denki's, and hurriedly knocked. Kaminari-san, please. He screamed in fear. I'm sorry. He heard a quiet voice through the other side of the door. Manitika. A feminine voice called out on the other end of the hallway. Minoru turned around and saw Keith standing at the end of the hallway. Out of fear, he started throwing his purple balls at her hoping to do something. However, Keith activated her lightning chakra mode, and the projectiles just bounced off her skin. She instantly closed the distance between the two of them and the rest was history. That night, everyone within a 10 kilometers radius heard a loud high-pitched scream. Chapter 46 Night Training Keep your V. Saying that I'm mad right now would be an understatement. I'm furious. This was the first time in both my lives that I have ever been this mad before. Heck, I don't even know someone can have this much rage. We were outside of the camp building. I looked at all the Class 1B boys prostrating in front of me with bruises all over their bodies. Especially my Netta and his face looked disfigured from the beatings I unleashed. The rest of the girls were behind me as well, and they were just as angry as I was. One thing that slightly cheered me up was that my classmates weren't the ones who committed this unforgiving act. So what lesson have we learned today? I asked with a smile. I'm sorry. I should have peeked more quietly and discreetly. It's also my incompetence that I got caught in the end. My Netta shouted. All of us looked at him with deadpan expressions. A tick mark appeared on my forehead as I kicked him like a football and he flew away into the dark night. Looking at the rest of them I sighed and walked away. I can tell their expressions brightened up, but that doesn't mean the suffering was over just because I left. After all, they still haven't paid for peeking at my other friends. I turned my head and I saw their faces crumpled to despair as the rest of the girls walked toward them with devilish smiles. I left, knowing that they will properly learn their lessons, I'm not sure about my netta but this should make the other boys think twice before doing something this stupid. Right now I needed to do something that will calm my nerves. And what's better to do other than more training? I grabbed my weapons and left the camp building. I found a spot that was pretty secluded and got into my stance, channeling my frustration into my swings. I'm not sure how much time has passed as training can really make you lose track of time. I stopped and noticed Todoroki leaning by a tree. What are you doing here? I asked. I saw you leave the camp area so I just wondered what you're up to. He said with a calm expression. How long have you been watching? I questioned him. Around 30 minutes, Todoroki answered. I see. I huffed and went back to swinging my sword. You okay? He asked with concern as he walked toward me. I'm still pretty angry, but I will be fine. I responded and slashed a tree in half. Watching the scene, he sighed. Fight me. Excuse me. I will help you train. It will help you get it all out of your system. He responded and he got into a boxing stance. I frowned but complied anyway and sheathed my katana. Since he doesn't have weapons, I will just fight him hand to hand. I thought that this method was a bit weird but I agreed because he insisted. I also got into position and I immediately rushed him at a fast speed. I punched his face but he blocked it and tried to land a punch of his own. I easily parried and strike him in the stomach. He grunted in pain and for the next few minutes, I continuously set out unrelenting barges of attack as more and more bruises started to appear on his body. Todoroki was pushed back. He finally got an opportunity and launched a kick toward me. I dodged and swiped his legs. Todoroki fell backward but he grabbed my hand and I was pulled down with him. Verpavad Shoto fell to the ground in pain. He tried to get up but something was on top of him. He looked down and his eyes widened in shock. His face turned red as Keed was lying on his chest. Shoto's face became even redder as he felt two mounds pressing on his body. Keed sat up and realized that she was on Shoto. 
She quickly got off of him and Shoto sighed in relief. Sorry about that. Keed quickly apologized and stood up. Shoto nodded as he was still too embarrassed to say anything. Thanks Todoroki-kun, I have calmed down now, Keed said with a smile. No problem, that's what friends are for, Shoto responded. Keed healed his injuries and together they sat in silence. Shoto didn't even land a hit on her and he was slightly annoyed by it. In terms of martial arts, Keed won by a landslide. You're way too nice, Todoroki-kun. Keed complimented him. How so? He muttered. You always know what to do to make me smile and even if you don't know it, you always care for others, Keed explained. So thank you, Todoroki-kun. His face started to heat up once again. He nodded and they resumed the silence. They continued to sit there for a while until Shoto finally opened his mouth. Shall we go back? Shoto asked but there was no response. Suddenly, he felt something leaning against his shoulder. He turned his head and saw Keed leaning on him asleep. Seeing this, Shoto sighed once again and he gently picked her up and brought her to the camp building. Keed snuggled deeply into his chest and she slept peacefully. Once he got back to the camp dorms he found Mina and Ochako. Shoto told them what happened and they agreed to help him place Keed on her bed. Well not before secretly taking a picture. Good morning. I woke up in my bed and I can't really remember what happened last night. I rubbed my eyes and tried to recall last night's event. That's when I remembered that I trained with Todoroki last night and I fell asleep. I must have been pretty tired but wait before fully going completely unconscious. I felt that I was gently being picked up. Todoroki-kun carried me back. I muttered while covering my face with my hands. I felt my face heating up from embarrassment. I hope I don't do anything dumb. I thought to myself. My phone suddenly vibrated, I turned it on and I blushed. It was a picture of me hugging Todoroki tightly while I was being carried in his arms. Chapter 47 Coda Key POV I finally got out of my bed and went to the cafeteria to get breakfast. I got my food and sat down next to Ochako and Mina. So how's your sleep? Mina asked with a teasing tone. My face got red again being reminded of what happened. It's not funny, okay? I just got tired from training. I yelled while pouting at the two of them. Sure, sure. Mina replied with an unconvinced tone. What else we could have been doing? I questioned. Mina and Ochako giggled. I pouted and ignored the two of them. For the rest of the day, I continued to try and master my lightning chakra mode. I also did some other training and I can safely say that I will now use my katana as my main weapon. When the training session ended, I returned to our camp building and there were tables and chairs stacked outside. Apparently today we will have to make our own dinner. My classmates seemed pretty excited as they will finally be doing something that you will do in a normal camp. We were supposed to form small groups and cook together. Kichan, please team up with us. Ochako and Mina jogged up to me. In the past, they have tasted my cooking before and since then they always wanted to eat my food whenever they got the chance. I nodded and they cheered while jumping up and down. The rest of the girls in my class also joined us. By looking at the ingredients, seems like we're making curry. Okay, Keith, you got this. I pumped myself up before cooking. Bit of cooking later. Whoa! Kichan, your food is delicious as always. Mina happily exclaimed and she speedily stuffed her face with my curry. The rest of my small group all agreed with her statement and they ate their food with more etiquette. Ah, there you are, Uchiha-chan, I can't find Koda anywhere. Can you help me find him and give Koda his dinner? Pixie Bob appeared next to me and asked. I frowned lightly before returning to my happy expression. This might be the time when the League of Villains strikes. Okay. I said and I went to find the boy with a plate of curry in my hands. I also equipped my weapons, I may be wrong about the villains attacking but it's better safe than sorry. I guess that he was probably at his hideout where I stumbled upon him yesterday. I steadily make my way to his hideout, and I spotted him sitting on the ground looking at the stars. I told you to stay away from this place. Koda grumbled. I must have forgotten. T. I replied with an innocent tone. A tick mark appeared on his head. Then leave now. Koda yelled. I'm here to give you dinner. I answered and sat next to him. I placed his food in front of him and the smell of curry wafted in the air. At first he ignored it but his stomach made a rumbling sound. He blushed in embarrassment and I chuckled. Koda slowly picked up the curry. He took a bite and his eyes widened. It's good, right? I made it myself after all. 
I said and patted my chest with pride. He snorted and quietly ate his dinner. When he finished, he lay the plate beside him, and together we gazed at the stars. Why are you still here? I finished my dinner so you can go now, Coda groaned. Why? I want to spend time with you after all. Stop lying, you just saying it to make me feel better. Just like every hero you will then abandon me. You will all leave just as they did. Coda muttered the last part in a sad tone. I didn't say anything but brought him close to my chest and hugged him tightly. In my previous life, I lost my parents at a young age so I know exactly what he was feeling. He struggled to break free of my embrace however he eventually stopped and quietly cried. I patted his back. There there, everything will be okay. I whispered. We stayed like this for a while. Coda calmed down and I let go as he went back to watch the stars with teary eyes. I wiped the tears off his face and smiled. Right now class 1A and 1B were supposed to do trial of courage or something but I decided to stay. Coda broke the silence and asked. You barely know me, but why are you being so nice? Hearing this I smiled faintly. Because I know what you're going through. I replied. His eyes widened in shock, and I giggled at his expression. I also lost people important to me in the past. But I moved on because I know that's what they wanted me to do. I said. I'm sorry. Coda apologized. There's no need to apologize, I acted like you too. However, there are people that helped me get through helping you as well. You just need to accept their help. I explained. Coda suddenly has a guilty look realizing how he's been rejecting the pussy cat's attempt of helping him, and he looked at the ground in shame. I once again brought him close and together we sat by the cliff in silence. Thanks. He mumbled. I patted his head and together we observed the beautiful night sky. However, this peaceful atmosphere was quickly broken when I spotted a dark figure wearing a black cloak and a white mask leaping toward us. The man took off his disguise in the air, he has a lot of muscles and blonde hair, wearing combat pants and a red tank top. He also has a large scar on the left side of his face with a prosthetic eye. I quickly realized who he was and I picked up Coda who was still hugging me and jumped backward. Immediately, the ground where we were sitting was destroyed by that man's punch. Muscular. I instinctively voiced out. You know my name? I must be pretty famous. Muscular said as he walked out of the dust caused by the destruction and stood in front of us. Coda looked at him stunned and his eyes started to get teary again. We, you're the one that killed Mama and Papa. He screamed. I killed a lot of people in my life, you need to be more specific. Muscular answered with a bored tone as he picked his ears with his finger. Coda became mad as he tried to charge at him but I held him in place. Stay behind me, I will protect you, I said with resolve. When he sang, Coda muttered and he stared at me with worry. Ha ha ha, what is someone like you gonna do anything? He laughed arrogantly at me. I unsheathed my blade and glared. I need to defeat him. I can't have someone like that wander freely in this world. I thought and readied my blade. Muscular grinned as his size increased and his body was covered with muscle fiber. You want to dance? Then let's dance. Chapter 48 League of Villains Strikes Again Keep POV, I activated my Sharingan as Muscular rushed towards me. I dodged sideways and launched a kick at his waist. He grunted but he instantly countered with a punch of his own. Huh, not bad. For such a small body, you have some strength, but it's not enough. Muscular shouted. His body enlarges while more muscle fiber covered his body like armor. His speed increased by a lot, and he immediately slammed his fists vertically in my direction. Crap I don't have the time to dodge. I exclaimed in my mind and activated lightning chakra mode. I blocked with my arms and my legs buckled from his brute strength. Muscular's hand shot and grasped me by the neck. I was lifted off the ground and thrown into the mountain. I hit the stone wall, creating a large dent. Thankfully, my lightning chakra mode was still active, and I didn't suffer any major damage. Muscular grinned and slowly approached me. With every step, the ground shook under his immense weight. You leave Wenisan alone. Coda shouted and he hurled a rock at Muscular's head. The rock just bounced off and Muscular glanced at Coda with glee. Ah, uh, by looking closer, you looked familiar. Tell me, boy, were your parents the pro hero's water hose? Muscular guessed. Coda started shaking at his response and tears fell out of his eyes. Seeing his reaction, Muscular's smile widened and he continued to agitate him. 
Yes, I remember now, they were a fun bunch, I especially like it when I slowly tear them. Shut up. Don't listen to him, Coda. I yelled and launched myself from the wall of the mountain. Like a spring, I shot towards muscular and swung my katana. He blocked with his wrist and my blade barely sank into his flesh. If the villain felt pain, he wasn't showing it as more muscle fiber wrapped around the blade and handle of my katana, trapping it in his wrist. I let go of my sword and planted my foot right onto his face while I leaped high into the air. However, Muscular also jumped after me. He grasped my foot and slammed me back onto the ground. I grunted, and my lightning chakra mode dissipated. Muscular was still holding on to me and he grinned in victory. But Coda interrupted him and blasted water into Muscular's eyes. Muscular growled as he let go of me and rubbed his face in irritation. I immediately stood up and reached for my sword which was still stuck to his wrist. My fingertips touched the blade and I inject as much electricity as I possibly could. Muscular screams and static shock traveled all over his body. Raisingan. I didn't give him time to recover and I continued to pressure him. A sphere made of pure chakra appeared in my hand and I drove the Raisingan into Muscular's stomach. A huge gust of wind was formed from the impact. All his muscle fiber armor broke and I continued to drive the Raisingan deeper into his belly. Muscular eyes rolled upwards and he stumbled back a few steps before falling onto the floor with white foam coming out of his mouth. Unfortunately, the huge amount of wind also blew Koda off the cliff and he screams in fear. Luckily, I got there in time and grabbed Koda by the back of the collar. I then pulled him back towards me. I brought him close to my chest. Like I said I will protect you, I said with a smile. He nodded but he still kept his arms around me, too scared to let go. Come on we should go back and call for one of the pussycats. I reasoned and, he answered. I gave Coda a piggyback ride and I ran back to camp as fast as I can. When we got close I saw fire everywhere, Coda and I panicked. I increased my pace and prayed that my friends were safe. Once we were there, I spotted Aizawa Sensei capturing a man in a black cloak wearing a theater mask with his scarf. There were broken mannequins littered around the floor. Suddenly the masked figure burst into the mud and disappeared. Aizawa Sensei clicked his teeth and dropped the clump of mud onto the floor. Aizawa Sensei, what's happening? I asked. Aizawa Sensei was surprised to see me, and he started briefing us on the situation. He told me that the League of Villains have attacked and everyone was scattered all around the forest. I nodded and set Koda down. I told Aizawa Sensei about Muscular. He frowned but congratulated me on protecting Koda. Kodakuen, please stay here and hide, okay? Wenichan here will defeat all the scary villains. I declared. Koda nodded. Before Aizawa Sensei could object, I sprinted deep into the woods. I leaped onto a tree branch and started jumping from tree to tree. My Sharingan was on full blast and I scanned for any signs of my friend. I eventually found Midoriya, Shoji, and Todoroki fighting a villain with a theatrical mask, a schoolgirl, a man wearing a gray and black bodysuit, and a man wearing another mask, top hat, and a big yellow coat. I jumped out of the trees and they were all surprised to see me as the villains dodged and I landed in the middle of them. Freeze! I shouted and they fell under my jinjutsu. However, the villain with the theatrical mask instantly broke free and lunged at me. I dodged and I felt my eyes bleeding from overusing my Sharingan. I landed a safe distance away and observed my new opponents. If I remembered correctly, the high school girl was Toga, the bodysuit man was twice, the man dressed as a magician was Mr. Compress and I don't know the last person. I saw that Mr. Compress have two beads in his mouth. This must be the moment they kidnapped Bakugo and Tokoyami. I immediately went towards Mr. Compress and he tried to restrain me but I ducked under his arms and punched him in the face. He spits out the two beads, I grab them and toss them toward my friend. Deal with her puppet man. Toga shouted at the unknown villain while pointing at me. The masked man nodded and a single human-sized mannequin appeared by his side. I quickly unsheathed my katana and blocked a strike from the puppet the mannequin looked crude with an expressionless face. It pounced at me with long blades attached to its wrist. I parried the attack and swung at the puppet's torso. My katana sliced it in half however seems like even if it was destroyed it can still function. The mannequin basically throws itself at me. I kicked it high into the air and threw my tanto at it. The small blade pierced its chest and the puppet was embedded into a side of a tree. I observed my surroundings my friends were battling Mr. Compress twice and Toga, 
they seems to be holding their ground. Bakugan Tokoyami escaped the beads and was recovering. I glanced at the masked man and he summoned two more of his puppets. However, this time they looked different. One was painted purple with long slender arms and legs while the other one was as huge as muscular with spikes all over its body. The purple puppet's arms lengthened to an unnatural degree. It tried to capture me but I easily dodged out of the way. The giant mannequin charged and smashed its fist on the ground where I was standing. I moved sideways and swung my katana at its chest however, the blade barely even made a scratch. I clicked my teeth in annoyance and dodged just before the giant puppet can make its attack. I sheathed my sword and lightning chakra formed in my hand, making the sounds of a thousand birds whistling. Chidori! I exclaimed and dashed towards the man controlling the two puppets. The purple puppet shot its arm at me and I easily cut it with Chidori. Unfortunately, even if I cut it off it just grew back a new pair of limbs. I jumped around in midair while narrowly darting around the flurry of arms. My plan worked and I smirked when the purple puppet's hand was tangled together. I left the puppet to its own demise and charged at the villain. My attack was about to reach my target, however. The giant puppet intercepted and took the hit. My chidori went straight through and my right hand was trapped in its chest. I heard clicking sounds behind me. I turned my head and saw the first puppet have escaped from the tree. The mannequin opened its mouth and a small blade coated with a weird liquid emerged from its throat. I thrashed but the giant puppet's arms held me in place the poisonous blade pierced my shoulder and I screamed in pain. I yanked the hidden blade out of me and threw the puppet to the ground. I smashed it with my foot and it crumbled to pieces. My hand finally broke free, leaving a gaping hole in the giant mannequin's chest. But, at this moment my head starts to spin and I was overcome with dizziness. I slumped onto the ground and gritted my teeth. I felt my body becoming weaker and weaker. I raised my head and saw that the purple puppet had untangled itself and was slowly reaching toward me. Therapy of seeing Keat collapse. Kagutsu nodded in satisfaction that the poison had worked. He commanded the purple puppet to restrain her. However, at this moment a huge iceberg erupted out of the ground where the puppet was standing. Once the dust settled, the purple puppet was trapped in the giant ice, frozen in place. Give her back! Shoto shouted with rage. He sprinted at Kagutsu. The giant puppet lunged at him but was melted down by Shoto's flame. He panted, out of breath. Shoto have lost control of his emotion and using all his power he sent a pillar of ice toward the villains. Suddenly a black portal warped in front of the pillar. The ice went through and another pillar appeared, launching the ice back to Shoto. Shoto was knocked back from his own attack. Kurwajiri came through the portal, and all of the villains gathered around him. Where's Bakugo? Kurwajiri asked. Change of plans, we will take her. Kagutsu gestured at Kid. Kurwajiri was frustrated, but he nodded unwillingly. Strings shot out of Kagutu's sleeves and they wrapped around Kid. Come back here. Shoto yelled as he stood up and dashed towards the villain. Sadly, he was too late as the villains escaped and the portal was closed behind them. Shoto was stunned as he fell onto his knees. He stared at the place where the villains had left in a daze. He punched the ground with his fists until blood seeped out of his knuckles. Echiha! Shoto muttered in sadness. Chapter 49 All for One Key POV I slowly opened my eyes and felt soreness all over my body. However, that was nothing compared to the burning pain in the back of my left shoulder. I can barely move, but it's just enough for me to see the bandaged stab wound. I sighed in relief knowing that at least I probably won't get an infection. The room I was in was pitch black, and I was tied down to a chair bounded by chains. In front of me was a giant metal door. From the looks of it, the door looks like it can take a lot of damage before breaking. My body refuses to listen to my command. There were still faint traces of poison left in me, and I needed to wait as my body slowly cleansed all the toxins. During the wait, I stared at the door with anxiety. What if they came in before I healed myself? What would they do to me? As time went by my fear grew and grew. But I am forcing myself to stay optimistic because bad things usually happen if you think about them. Finally, after waiting for 30 minutes, the poison disappeared. I moved my arms to test the tightness of my restraints. The chain made a clanging noise and barely budged, and I clicked my teeth in frustration. My lower body was tied to the legs of the chair, I tried moving them as well but it was just as tight. Suddenly I have an idea. 
I realized that they had made a significant mistake when restraining me. My hands were tied together so I could still do hand signs. Kage Bunshin no Jetsu. I whispered and weaved the correct order of hand signs. My shadow clone appeared behind me. Keed number two first repaired the wound on my shoulder before kneeling and grabbing a part of the metal chain and pulling with all her strength. A deafening sound was made and the chain snapped and I was free from my shackles. I heard the sound of the door opening, and I immediately built chakra onto my feet and stuck to the ceiling while my shadow clone sat on the chair. The vault door opened, and a skinny gray nomu entered. The monster stared at my clone before walking closer. I jumped down and struck the nomu in the back of the neck, it went limp and collapsed. I placed the nomu on the chair and shut the vault door as I exited. There was a long dark hallway connected to multiple paths, and I stealthily wandered around. I soon realized that I was in a place where Nomu were created. This further strengthens my resolve to escape. It wasn't long for I to locate my weapons in one of the rooms, it's weird how it wasn't thrown away, but I'm not complaining. However, two Nomu were guarding it. I used transformation jutsu and transformed it into a Nomu. I walked in and they stared at me but didn't make a move. I grabbed all my things and left these two creatures alone. Thank goodness that worked. I thought to myself and undid the transformation. I equipped all my weapons and continued finding a way out of there. After a few more turns, I saw light in one of the rooms and walked over to have a closer look. I peeked my head over the door frame. Inside was a tall man sitting in a big office chair. His back was turned against me, and he was watching the screen. The man wore a black suit and an intimidating skull-like mask. All for one. I thought to myself and my face paled upon realizing who it was. That woman's quirk you gave me was useful, Tamura, AFO said in a deep tone. Thank you, Sensei. I also sent you that one a student. Her eyes have shown some unique abilities and I know that she will entice you, Tamura said through the screen. Very well, I will request for Dr. Garaki to attempt an eye transplant, AFO replied. Speaking of which, it seems like a little bird has gotten out of its cage. AFO muttered and he turned his head towards me. I widened my eyes in shock and quickly ran away from the room and back into the hallway. Suddenly the entire building started shaking, and I heard a loud explosion. I dashed through the hallway, and I eventually see the outside, but before I could reach it, black gunk dripped out of the walls. The liquid hit me and I felt myself being sucked in. Therpiov is keyed here. Itachi asked with hope. Sorry, Red Crow, we're still not finding anything. One of the police officers replied. Itachi frowned, but he still didn't give up. Itachi promised himself that he would not rest until he found her. He can still clearly remember the exact moment he heard the news. Flaskback Red Crow's agency, it was night when Itachi's office phone started ringing like crazy. He frowned when he saw that All Might was calling him. Itachi, this is bad. The training camp was attacked and the villains took your sister. The attack happened too. Before All Might could even finish, Itachi's crushed the phone into pieces. A minute later, Shursue, who was outside, heard loud noises in Itachi's office. Itachi, what's wrong? Shursue asked as he walked in. His eyes widened. The office was trashed entirely. All the furniture was destroyed, and black Amaratsu flames were burning at every corner. Itachi stood in the middle of the room, and his emotions were out of control. Oi, calm down. What's happening? Shursue exclaimed and rushed to his friend. Keed, she got kidnapped. Itachi said with an angered expression. Flashback end. Fugaku and Mikoto were devastated when they received the news. It's not just them. Every Uchiha member was shocked, and they all prayed that Keed would return unharmed. Itachi joined the second team raiding the villain's warehouse while Shursue joined the other. Itachi's group consisted of Best Genist, Mountain Lady, Gang Orca, Tiger and finally him. Itachi's gut feeling told him that his little sister was being held captive here, but his anxiety grew and grew as the seconds went by. As soon as they blew a hole into the abandoned building, multiple Nomu came out charging at them, but they easily defeated all the monsters. They found Ragdoll unconscious, and Tiger carried her to safety. Huh, who are you? Suddenly Best Genist shouted. A man dressed in a black suit wearing a skull mask walked forward. Itachi and the heroes kept their eyes on him. Instantly, the man appeared in front of Best Genist. 
However, Itachi reacted and pulled Best Genus back, away from the stranger's attack. That's when Itachi realized who that man was. All for one. Itachi muttered and readied his sword. AFO snapped his finger, and black liquid covered the ground above him. He reached his hand in and pulled Keed out of the portal. He was holding Keed by the neck and lifted her in the air. Itachi's face paled as he watched his sister in AFO's grasp. Black Liquid also appeared behind Itachi, Mina, Ochako, Shoto, Izuku, Tenya, and Momo and fell out of the portal. Itachi was surprised, but right now they were the least of his worries. Keed! Mina screamed in fear when she saw what was happening. The pro heroes and the police can't make a move, and they're afraid that if they did, AFO would kill Keed. However, out of everyone's expectation, electricity appeared in Keed's hands and she struck AFO's arm. AFO grunted in pain as the muscle in his wrist constricted and twitched. His hand instinctively opened and Keed dropped to the ground. Sensing this opportunity, Itachi's body flickered towards AFO as he caught Keed and kicked the villain in the stomach. AFO was sent crashing into a building, and Itachi retreated back to the group. Oniai-chan, Keed said as she found herself in Itachi's arms. Itachi's cold expression crumpled as tears formed in his eyes. Keed, you're safe. I'm so glad. He muttered as he hugged her. Everyone heard the sound of applause, and they all turned their head and saw AFO clapping while walking out of the destroyed building. It brings a tear to my eye seeing family reunite. He said with a sarcastic tone. Keed and Itachi scowled as they stared at him. AFO snapped his fingers again, and behind him a portal was formed. Tamura and the remaining League of Villains emerged. Kurwajiri warped Tamura and the others away from here. AFO said while pointing at Tamura. But Sensei, I want to stay and fight. Tamura exclaimed. I just saved you, don't make it go to waste. Now scram. AFO demanded. Before Tamura could argue further, Kurwajiri warped the League of Villains away. Now let's have some fun, AFO said. Even if a mask covered his face, they could tell that he was grinning sadistically as he stared at them. Chapter 50 All for One Part 2 Keep of all of you get out of here now. Itachonia-chan shouted as he glanced at my friends and me. We suddenly felt vibrations in the ground, and countless Nomu dug themselves out of the Earth's surface. They were brown with long sharp claws, teeth and spikes protruding from their back. The heroes and the police scowled. There are probably at least 50 of them, and they formed a circle around us. It's too risky to defeat them without casualties, and killing may be unavoidable. The leader of the police force stated, and the pro heroes nodded in agreement. My friends and I immediately panicked killing? Can we do that? All of us thought at the same time I always know that on my journey to being a hero one day I may have to slay my enemies, but even if I know it's going to happen sooner or later, I still find it hard to believe. Everyone else noticed what we were feeling and smiled with sympathy. Itachioni Aichan said. You guys can go hide, we will protect you. I watched my friends' reactions. They clenched their fists and gritted their teeth in frustration, knowing they would be a liability. They stared at me and waited for my decision. I took a deep breath. I'm sorry Oniai-chan but we have to decline. We won't be dead weight and we'll fight with all we got, even if we have to kill. Then so be it. I turned my head and glimpsed at my friends, they were still scared, but there was determination and resolve in their eyes. The heroes and police were going to argue with us. But before they could, all the Nomu roared and charged. Itatonishan parried a strike with his umbu sword and kicked it in the face. Mountain Lady stomped on one of the monsters. Gang Orca used his quirk and created a large sound wave to blast them away. Best Genus trapped many Nomu with his strings, and the police started firing at them with their machine guns. However, my friends and I haven't made a move yet. Even if we were determined to fight back, it was still petrifying. Kichan, watch out! Chako yelled. I turned and saw a Nomu lunging towards me, its claws reaching for my face but an ice spike pierced it right in the chest, killing it. This isn't the time to be afraid. We all decided not to be a liability. Todoroki shouted. The rest of us snapped out of our daze. I gritted my teeth and swung my blade at another Nomu running toward me. My katana cut my target in half and instantly killed it. A tear escaped my eye as I cringed away from the now-dead Nomu. My hands were trembling. 
I couldn't believe what I had done. Even though they're monsters, Nomu were made from people. Todoroki Kuen's right. A hero can't always capture villains without consequences, I said with bated breath. My friends were stunned by my action, but they all nodded. Midoriya activated full cowling and punched a Nomu in the chest, breaking its bones. The monster was blown away and landed unmoving on the floor a dozen meters away. Midoriya was shaken, however. He continued to fight and sprinted towards the nearest Nomu. Soon all my classmates fought back while some tried their best not to kill any of the enemies. Onayakan saw that we were managing. He nodded to himself and glared at AFO, who was observing the battle with amusement. Itachuniachan built chakra into his lower body and charged at AFO with his sword drawn. Therpiovifo saw Itachi dashing at him and smiled. Itachi's quirks have always fascinated him. And now that the hero was presenting himself to him on a silver platter, AFO couldn't be happier. Black tendrils shot out of AFO's fingers and Itachi slashed all the tendrils to pieces. Kasekin? Itachi shouted as he coated his left fist with flames and aimed for the villain's face. AFO caught the attack with his hand and Itachi twists his body midair, breaking free from the villain's grasp. Then, Gokaku no Jetsu. Itachi expels a colossal fireball from his mouth point blank into AFO's body. AFO endured the attack, and he charged through the flames. His arm enlarges as rebar and bone spikes emerge out of his skin before smashing his arm down at Itachi. When the attack reaches him, Itachi bursts into a flock of crows. AFO was surprised, and he sensed danger behind him. The villain turned around and Itachi stared at AFO, his Manjiku Sharingan spinning rapidly. Amaterasu! Itachi yelled. He showed AFO no mercy as his Amaterasu was in full power, and he intended to burn AFO into nothing but ash. Black Amaterasu flames burned AFO, melting his body, and he roared in agony. No matter what he does, the fire won't disappear. After a while, Itachi extinguished Amaterasu and his right eye lost vision. AFO's regeneration quirk kicks in, and his body starts to recover. Unfortunately for AFO, his body couldn't fully heal from the damage, and his entire body was now also covered with permanent burn marks. FO was enraged. How can a measly bug like him hurt me? Both of his arms turned into massive drills made of bones as he rushed towards Itachi. Itachi made many shadow clones of himself, and all of their body flickered towards the symbol of evil. AFO instantly reacted by swinging his drill-like arm in an arc, and he immediately eliminated all of the clones. Fortunately, that gives Itachi time to attack AFO with his sword. Itachi managed to slash AFO's stomach, but the injury healed in a blink of an eye and AFO stabbed back with his drill arm. Itachi dodged but was not. Fast enough as the drill left a cut on Itachi's shoulder, and blood oozed out. He leapt backward. Sisanu. Itachi yelled and a giant orange humanoid wearing Tengu armor formed around him. Itachi Sisanu flew high into the air with its wings. A sword and shield made of pure flame and orange chakra manifested in Sisanu's hand. It pointed its sword at AFO, who watched with interest. A slash N. I'm removing Itachi Sisanu's sword of Tatsuka and Yoda mirror cause it's too broken in the MHA world, so he gets a normal sword and shield instead. It then dived towards AFO with its sword raised, ready to strike. AFO used his immense strength and jumped high into the air as he flew towards Sisanu like a missile. AFO pointed his drill at Sisanu, and Itachi blocked with his shield. However, AFO pierced through Itachi's shield and continued to make its way toward the hero himself. The Sisanu swung its sword down at AFO. Both attacks hit each other simultaneously, and a massive explosion was formed, interrupting everyone's battle. Oniai-chan! Keed screamed with fear as she stared at the vast cloud of smoke. The smoke quickly dispersed. AFO and Itachi were both standing with various wounds over each body. They were both panting tiredly and stared at each other with frustration. AFO's mask was broken, revealing his face, his entire head was covered with deep scar tissue, and the only facial feature was his mouth. They stared at each other, not making a move. This continues until an evil grin appears on AFO's face. You made a mistake, Red Crow. Villains never play fair. AFO exclaimed and he exploited one of Itachi's most significant weaknesses. Before anyone could react, AFO lunged at Keed, planning to take her life. 
Chapter 51 Awakened Key POV I turned my head and spotted AFO lunging at me, and I didn't have time to get out of the way. His massive drill-like hand loomed over me, and I closed my eyes in fear, preparing for the worst. Someone suddenly pushed me out of the way, and I my eyes widened in shock. In front of me was my Oniai-chan and he pushed me away from the trajectory of the attack. However, in doing so, he suffered a large slash wound that spread diagonally from his lower waist to his shoulder. His left arm also wasn't spared, and it was completely severed from his shoulder. Oniai-chan! I screamed in fright. AFO smirked and he kicked Oniai-chan in the chest. My Oniai-chan's limp body was launched away and crashed into a concrete wall. I instantly forgot about everything around me, and I sprinted to my Oniai-chan. Itachi Oniai-chan's body was slumped and leaning against the wall. A pool of blood was forming around him. I landed next to him and examined his body in a panic. He was still breathing but it was getting weaker, and apply medical ninjutsu in a desperate attempt to save him. Oniai-chan. I muttered with tears in my eyes. He, he quietly mumbled. Don't talk and save your energy. I demanded and continued to heal him. I suddenly heard shouting from all directions. I looked up and watched AFO attacking the rest of the heroes. The villain released a blast of air at my friends, who yelled in pain and were thrown into the air. The pro heroes tried to counterattack, but it was useless and AFO easily defeated them one by one. AFO punched Gang Orca straight in his stomach, knocking him away. He then uses his telekinesis quirk and sends a barrage of debris at Mountain Lady. Best Genus tried to fight back, but AFO dodged and pulled on the strings. Best Genus was pulled toward him, and AFO grasped him by the head before smashing his face into the ground. I gritted my teeth in frustration and focused back on healing. I tore pieces of fabric off my clothes and bandaged his injuries, but that attempt was useless as blood continued to gush out of him. Because of me my Oniai-chan got hurt like this. I'm weak. I'm so useless. I'm nothing but a burden. I cried. Because of my weakness, I was defeated and captured by the villains. Because of me everyone's fighting and getting hurt right now. I wept in despair as AFO defeated everyone. And I was the only one left. He looked at my suffering with amusement. Suddenly I felt two fingers gently tapping me on the forehead. Stop crying you are strong, Keed. You're my sister after all. Itachioniai-chan joked. I watched as Itachioniai-chan smiled and he closed his eyes. No, 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 not like this. Please wake up. Wake up. A massive headache assaulted my mind and I grasped my head in agony. Tons of information were loaded into my brain, and I felt a weird sensation in my eyes as my tears turned blood red. Despite the pain, I glimpsed at my reflection from the pieces of broken glass next to us. Instead of the three tomo, now my pupil has the shape of a flower with six petals. My head stopped hurting, and I processed the new information loaded into my brain. Third POVFO took his time and approached Keed. He loves watching people suffering. To him, this is the best part of being a villain. AFO extended his hand, reaching for Keed and ending it once and for all. However, his hand phases through Keed as if her body was a mere illusion. Keed immediately turned around and threw a punch with all her might. AFO grunted from the impact, and he was blown away. He was surprised but not by the pain but AFO felt his physical strength leaving his body. Keed looked at the distant figure of AFO and flexed her fingers. She noticed that her body was filled with power and vitality, and her minor injuries from the battle started to repair themselves rapidly. Keed's eyes widened and realized she was maybe just able to fix everything. Keed turned back to her brother took a deep breath and placed her hand on his chest. Itachi POV. Everything was dark, and it felt like I was covered in water. A light manifested itself in front of me, and I instinctively reached out for it. Everything became apparent and my eyes opened. I groaned as a wave of dizziness assaulted my mind and the memories of recent events flashed in my brain. Thank God it worked. I'm so glad. I heard a weak voice. My vision slowly became more precise, and I was shocked to see the disheveled appearance of my little sister. Keed's face was pale with a sickly expression. I was stunned to see her condition, but I was even more surprised knowing that I was still moving from my injuries. I glanced down and saw that all my wounds were healed, my left arm was still missing, 
but it had been closed up as if my arm had already been missing a long time ago. The massive cut had also disappeared, and what remained was a scar that reminded me of the damage. Before I could question everything, Keed was grabbed by the back of her neck and AFO tossed her away like nothing. Thud Keed fell hard onto the floor, and she coughed up blood. Before going unconscious, I couldn't even process what happened and my vision was dyed red with anger. Remove, you're still alive. How? AFO said with confusion. His questions were left unanswered and a massive amount of killing intent leaked out of Itachi. With a speed that shouldn't even be possible for someone who just suffered a fatal injury, a katana made of flames manifested out of Itachi's hand, and he severed AFO's legs without effort. Itachi has entirely lost control as rage overtook him, and from the anger, his power increased to an unbelievable state. AFO screamed in pain, and for the next ten minutes what can be called a one-sided beatdown happened. Ten minutes later, come on then, kill me, AFO said and he lay on the ground while Itachi stared down at him. Itachi raised his sword, ready to do the finishing blow. However, All Might arrived next to him. Stop young Itachi. All Might shouted at the enraged Itachi. All Might had finally arrived at the scene when the League of Villains escaped. He tried his best to get here, but multiple Nomu appeared before him. These Nomu were explicitly built to combat All Might, and it took him some time to defeat them. Itachi stopped and he listened to All Might. Afo saw this and smiled in glee. What are you waiting for? Kill me. All Might glared at his nemesis, and without hesitation, All Might brought his fist down on Afo's face, shutting him up. Seeing Afo defeated, Itachi snapped out of his anger and rushed to where Keed was. Itachi sighed in relief that Keed was still breathing, relieving his fear. More heroes started to arrive, along with police officers and ambulances, and the injured were all quickly taken away, signaling the end of this dark day. Chapter 52 Aftermath Thirpo, where am I? Keed thought to herself and found herself lying on something soft. She sat up and observed her surroundings but wait, she couldn't see anything. Keed touched her face and sensed that there was fabric covering her eyes. Before Keed could investigate more, two people pulled her into a hug. Keed, you're awake. Mikoto and Fugaku yelled with happiness as they embraced Keed tightly. Keed, mom, dad. Yes, we're here. Everything's fine now, Mikoto soothed. What's happening? Where are we? Keed asked. Mikoto told her daughter that they were in the hospital and that she had been asleep for a couple of days now. Everyone else has already recovered, but only Keed remains unconscious. When Keed finally woke up, Fugaku and Mikoto felt a massive weight being lifted off their chest download app. Keed was surprised that she was unconscious for that long but visibly relaxed once. Knowing that it was finally over, however, that didn't last long as she started to recall the battle. Onyai-chan. Where is he? Keed asked with panic. Itachi's fine. However, it's best if he would be the one to explain. Mikoto's voice gradually trailed off at the end. Explain what? Where is he? Keed questioned and she felt that whatever her mother was going to say won't be good news. She already guessed what happened, but she prayed in her mind that whatever she was thinking of wasn't true. Mikoto called Itachi with her phone. Because of his job, he has to deal with the aftermath of the AFO's destruction. Twenty minutes later, Itachi burst into the room. He sighed in relief when they saw his little sister finally woke up. Onyai-chan, what's wrong? Mom won't tell me. Keed snapped with anxiety. There was silence and nobody says a word. Itachi slowly reaches out his hand and caresses his sister's face. Keed's lips quivered and she flinched in shock. Instead of feeling the warm touch of her beloved brother, all Keed could feel was something cold and metallic. Keed couldn't believe what she was feeling and snatched Itachi's hand. Her body trembled and not a single flesh could be detected on Itachi's left arm. Keed's composure completely collapsed and she sobbed with sorrow. Tears streamed down her soaked blindfold like a rapid river and dripped onto Itachi's mechanical hand. Be because of me. Onyai-chan. Lo lost. His arm. She stuttered. Keed believes that she was the cause of this, and she wept loudly. It's all my fault. I'm weak and useless. Keed continually insults herself. She suddenly felt pain as Itachi lightly chopped the top of Keed's head. She winced and rubbed the spot where Itachi hit her. Foolish sister of mine, you're not weak. 
It's not your fault and it never will be. I would have died that day if it weren't for you. Everyone feel will feel useless once in their life so stop this nonsense. No matter what you do, I will always love you. Itachi said. Keed glanced at her parents and they nodded. Don't bear the pain all by yourself, we will be here for you always so just let it all out. Fugaku urged with a soft tone. Keed started to cry louder than before, and she let out all these bottled up feelings. She tried to act optimistic when she got taken by the villains. Keed also suppressed the feeling when she killed the Nomu during the battle, and she wanted to act strong and not be a liability. But the truth was she was terrified. With every swing of her blade, Keed was scared that killing would corrupt her mind and one day does something she will truly regret. In her mind, Keed believes a hero will always need to have a smile on their face. But by having this mindset, these negative thoughts slowly eat away at her soul. These emotions led her mind astray, and she blamed herself for the harm she caused to her family. Keed let all of these feelings out in her cry. Itachi and her parents just continued to embrace her, letting her know that they were there for her. Before anyone had realized it, Keed had drifted off to sleep and she used all her energy crying. The three Uchihas gently laid her back on her bed. There was a relaxed expression on her face, and the family was glad that Keed stopped hiding these bad thoughts. They all decided to leave and let her rest. Itachi Bovidad brought mom to the car while I talked with the doctor about Keed's condition. Thankfully, I was told that her injuries will heal naturally, and there was nothing for us to worry about. I was happy that she told us how she truly felt and stopped blaming herself for my injury. I was also shocked to find her Sharingan evolved, but at the same time I was incredibly proud of her as she's getting stronger daily. Maybe she will even surpass me in no time. However, she still have to wear the blindfold for a day or so from the strain she placed on her eyes on my way back. I heard more crying in one of the other patient rooms. The door was left open, and I instinctively stopped just outside. I turned my head and saw a woman with emerald green hair sitting on her hospital bed and weeping while covering her face with her hands. It's sure Toko. Her hero's name was Ragdoll, and she was the hero taken by the League of Villains along with Keed. On the debrief, we've been told that AFO has taken her quirk, so she can no longer be a pro hero. Are you okay? I stood in the doorway and asked. She raised her head and glanced at me with her round yellow eyes. Oh, hello, Uchiha san. I'm fine, thanks for asking. It was clear that she was anything but okay. I walked in and said, I've heard about what happened. Shiratoko nodded with a sad smile on her face. Yeah but it's fitting for my punishment for allowing your sister to get kidnapped. Keed's kidnapping will forever be a sore subject for my family, but no matter how mad I was, I couldn't really blame the wild wild pussycats. They were severely outnumbered, and their hero team was fit for mountain rescue instead of fighting. Ultimately, it's the villain's fault, and Yue's security is too weak. I clenched my fist just thinking about Yue. Our family wasn't sure we wanted Keed to attend that school anymore. I just wish she would understand. I took a deep breath and said calmly, don't put yourself to blame. What's over is over. There's no point talking about the past now. Even if you say so, I can't forgive myself for my failure, Shiratoko-san muttered. Everyone will make mistakes, no matter how big or small these mistakes are. That's why we get stronger to make sure not to let it happen again. But how will I do that if I don't have my quirks anymore? Shiratoko replied with a slightly agitated voice. Who said that losing your quirk stops you from being a hero? No matter how far or how many times you fall, stand back up and fight to protect the people important to you. That's the true essence of a hero. I said. I walked closer to Shiratoko-san and patted her head. Hearing this, I could see the light returns to her eyes, and she giggled. You know Uchiha-san, you sure sound like an old man. Shiratoko pointed. I chuckled at her comment and walked back out to the hallway. I hope you get well soon, I said before leaving the room. Therpy of watching Itachi's leaving figure, Tomoko Shiratoko, thought back to what he said. He's right. A quirk doesn't define me. It's what I do that will make a difference, she said passionately as she pumped her fists. Her previous energetic personality soon returned. Thanks, Uchiha-san, I won't forget this. Tomoko muttered and blushed when she recalled the sensation of Itachi patting her head. Chapter 53 Forgiveness A few days later, Kipiov, after being released from the hospital, 
I came to accept what happened and move on because that's what my family would have wanted. As much as I hate to admit it, Itetraniachan does look pretty cool. The scientists in I Island designed it so you know it's some top quality technology. After the battle with AFO, he was apprehended by authorities and locked away deep in the cell of Tartarus. However, with the fall of the symbol of evil, the symbol of peace also collapsed. All Might used all his remaining strength to fight the multiple dangerous Nomu that were just as strong if not stronger than that one Nomu in the USJ incident. For defeating AFO, Itachioniaichan took the position as the strongest hero in Japan, while Endeavor stayed in second place. I was still shocked that I'd managed to unlock my Manji Kusharingan. My first ability was Kamui, specifically Abido's Kamui. I was ecstatic to have this powerful ability, but there are still limitations. Unlike Abito, I can't spam it, or else I will overstrain my eyes. My second ability was something new. Following tradition, I called it Daikoku, the Japanese god of wealth and harvest. The ability allows me to reap my enemy's strength, vitality, or memories through physical contact, and use it as my own. This means that the longer I fight, the stronger and faster I will become. What was taken can also be gifted as I can transfer this stolen energy and give it to someone else. Unfortunately, this accumulated power will disappear after the fight. There were still some exceptions. Thankfully, in this world, using the Manjiku Sharingan wasn't as devastating comparing to the Naruto world. The worst-case scenario will be temporary vision loss, but it's still detrimental in a fight. Enough about my Manjiku. Currently, I'm in the living room, reading a letter written by Koda. He talked about how worried he was and that he will become a hero just like me in the future. The doorbell to our house suddenly started ringing, snapping out of my focus. Itachi, can you go get it? Mom called from the kitchen. Itachi Oniai-chan nodded and he walked to the front door. I wonder who it was? I thought to myself and don't recall that we're expecting anyone. Third POV. Itachi opened the front door, scowling as he stared at the two people in front of him. All Might and Shota Aizawa are standing outside their front entrance in business like a tires. What do you want? Itachi said with an annoyed tone. May we come in? All Might asked and Itachi reluctantly nodded. He called for his parents, who were shocked to see the two heroes in their house. The atmosphere was tense and Itachi guided the two heroes to sit at the dining room table. Mikoto poured everyone a cup of tea. When she finished, Fugaka said with a soft voice. Heed, can you go upstairs? Fugaka asked. Dad, everything will be fine, Keed. Fugaka smiled. Keed nodded and quietly went back to her room. They sat opposite each other. At first, there was silence before Shota finally explained the reason they were there. The two heroes first apologized for Yue's lack of attention to security and informed them about Yue's plan to increase their safety precautions. Principal Nizu decided to implement the dorm system, and they're here to ask for Fugaku and Mikoto's permission to allow Keed to stay abroad in Yue. When they finished speaking, the two family members were silent and glanced at each other. Fugaka stood up from his seat. Thank you for your offer, but we sincerely decline. After this incident, we lost trust in Yue. Out of everyone's expectation, all might be transformed into his muscular form and prostrated in front of Mikoto, Fugaku, and Itachi. The three of them were shocked by his action. I'm truly sorry for the lack of expertise Yue has shown. I fully understand your decisions but please, gave us one last chance. Fugaka sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. He didn't expect things would turn out this way. The truth was, somewhere in the Uchiha's heart, a tiny part of them wanted to believe All Might's words. However, with how things turned out, they're unsure if that's the right decision. Fugaku sternly stared at the prostrating All Might in silence before speaking. Itachi. He said with a severe and cold tone. Itachi nodded and stood in front of All Might as he grabbed him by the collar and lifted him to kneel. Tsukuyami, Itachi muttered and forced All Might to stare at him with his Manjiku Sharingan spinning rapidly. What are you doing? Shota exclaimed and hurriedly stood up from his seat but was stopped by Fugaku. If you two were truly sorry, then there's nothing to worry about, Fugaku responded. Inside the Tsukuyami space, All Might found himself in a strange place with the floor flooded with a few inches of water and a massive crimson moon hanging above him, painting the sky blood red. All Might observed his own body and realized that he was back in his muscle form. 
He didn't feel the pain that forced him to change back for some reason and All Might can't transform into his true form even if he wanted to. All Might heard footsteps and noticed Itachi walking toward him with his scarlet eyes spinning rapidly. This is the Tsukoimi space. One second here was equivalent to 1 times 10 to the power of negative 11 second in the real world, Itachi explained with a cold expression. All Might have heard about this ability Itachi possesses. Although he rarely uses it, it was potent and terrifying. Before he could say anything, All Might felt pain when Itachi's fist sank into his stomach, and he was blown away a wall made of marbles emerges from the ground and All Might crashed into the hard structure. What? All Might groaned. Prove that our family should let Keed continue attending UA. Show me your resolve. Was the prostrating all just an act? Itachi said and slowly approached All Might hearing this. All Might gritted his teeth. He acknowledges the training camp incident was ultimately their fault, and he knows he deserves it. All Might will gladly take any punishment if that means he can earn the forgiveness of the Uchiha family. Hours later, Punches, kicks, and even sword slashes were delivered and All Might's body suffered from various wounds. Blood has trickled, bruises were made and bones have broken however, the hero didn't back down. Every time he was hit, All Might will get back up and continue to kneel before Itachi. I'm sorry. All Might have repeatedly been saying those two words his entire time in this space, but he knows that no matter how many times he says it, it will never be enough to repair the pain Yue has caused. All Might closed his eyes, awaiting the next round of beating. Boom! However, no pain came. All Might hesitantly opened his eyes, and Itachi's fist landed right next to his face, destroying the floor. Why do you want Kid to go to Yue so much that you're willing to endure this long? Itachi asked with a sad tone. Itachi hated every moment of this. He admired All Might, but he will go through it for Kid. Because I failed her. I failed you. How can I be the symbol of peace if I can't even save one person from harm? You're no longer the symbol of peace. All Might nodded. That's why my last wish before I'm gone was to help shape the future generation, so they will be better than me and stop these things like this from happening. So please give us one final chance. All Might's forehead touched the blood-stained ground. Do you not have long? Itachi asked with surprise. I'm not sure. But Sir Naitai's prophecy has never been wrong. All Might answered with a nostalgic smile when he remembered his time with his former sidekick. Itachi was well aware of who Sir Naitai was. He has worked with him in the past, and even he must admit that Sir Naitai's future sight has never been incorrect. Instantly, All Might found himself back on the Uchiha household's dining room floor, and in his weakened form. He gasped for air and sweat dripped from his face. Itachi, what was your decision? Mikoto asked. Itachi thought for a while before finally answering. I say we gave it a try. However, if I deem that Yue's security was lacking, we will immediately take Keed out of Yue. Shota and All Might nodded with understanding. Thank you. They both bowed before leaving. When they left, Fugaka glanced at Itachi. Have you made the correct choice? I don't know. Itachi responded. Even if Itachi wasn't sure himself, Fugaka fully trusts his son's choice. He knows that Itachi must have a reason, and even if the reason was stupid, Fugaka will support him. Chapter 54 Heights Alliance Storm Key POV I was astonished that Dad had allowed me to participate in the UA dorm system. When All Might and Aizawa Sensei came into our house, I guessed why they were there. I already accepted that there was an extremely high chance my family won't allow me to go to UA anymore. I will be lying to say that I wasn't saddened to not be able to go to the same school as my friends. However, I understood my family's concern knowing that they were doing what was best for me. So you won't imagine the relief that washed over me once I was allowed to continue studying at UA. Some time later, I have spent the rest of my holiday constantly training my Mangekyo Sharingan since Yue request us to not leave our own homes for our safety. I kept using my abilities repeatedly till I felt that I was about to lose vision. My family scolded me for doing this but eventually relented as my skills were on using the Mangekyo Sharingan were improving. Now, I can use my Manjikyo Sharingan multiple times before side effects start showing. For Kamui, I can make my body intangible teleport for a limited distance and have a dimension space the size of a small room where I can store my things. 
For Daikoku, I can now manage how much power I will take from my enemies, and the speed of the draining process increased exponentially. So even if I just grazed my opponents slightly, I can take an absurd amount of strength from them. Right now my family and I are standing outside of our house. They were giving me a final farewell. Students were supposed to be escorted by UA staff, but Itachi Oniai-chan will walk to school with me, even if he doesn't work for UA. After all, having the number one hero in Japan escorting you was the much better option. Most things from my room were already sent to UA, and all I have now were clothes and some small personal belongings like my weapons were stored in Kamui. Please stay safe, Keed. We will miss you very much. Mom said while pulling me into an embrace and started to cry. I will, Mom, I replied and also got a little emotional. Be careful, Keed. Come and see us once in a while, okay? Dad said. And thankfully, we're still allowed to leave the school, but we need permission from the teachers. Unfortunately, because of the recent attacks, that feature won't be implemented until things die down. Therefore, I won't see my family for a while, but I'm happy to know we won't be separated forever. I took a step forward out of the house before quickly running back and giving my parents one last goodbye hug. I will miss you. I yelled. They laughed. You will be late, Keed. Mom said as she gently pushed me away. I nodded and looked at my parents one last time before leaving. Oniai-chan and I slowly made our way to UA, strolling and enjoying each other's company. When we finally arrived at UA, Itachi Oniai-chan had a sad smile on his face and he took a scroll from his back pocket and handed it to me. I want to give this to you. He explained and placed the scroll in my hand. What is it? It's a move that can help you get stronger. I hope you can master it. Thank you so much. I said with excitement he chuckled and gave me the signature forehead tap. I hugged him as well before entering UA. When I entered I was surprised to see the massive transformation that UA has gone through. Now there were large buildings constructed in large rows in the span of a couple of acre. These must be our dorms. I thought to myself. I spotted many other students there. And I took out the form UA gave me. It said where 1A's dorm was located and I followed its instructions. Took me some time but I was able to locate my dorm. My friends have already arrived. Some have an anxious look while some were excited about this new experience. Hi everyone. I yelled out to them happily. Immediately Ochako and Mina tackled me onto the floor and hugged me. Their faces were full of concern. I understand why they were worried because other than my relatives, the hospital stopped everyone else from visiting me. I don't know why they do it but I won't argue with doctors. I messaged my friends about my circumstances but it's different from seeing it from a screen and actually seeing the person. After my classmates know that I was really okay, they calmed down and we talked about how we spent our remaining holidays until Aizawa Sensei arrived and guided us into the building. As everyone was entering our new dorm suddenly someone tapped me on the back. I turned around and saw Todoroki looking at me with a grim expression. Is there something wrong Todoroki-kun? I'm sorry. He said with a depressed tone. Eh for what? I failed to stop the villains from kidnapping you. He answered with slumped shoulders. I smiled and gently bonked him on the head with my fist. Todoroki was surprised. He raised his head and saw my smile. But you also tried to rescue me, right? Todoroki nodded and I giggled. Even if you're not aware of it, that really meant a lot to me. So cheer up, okay? I turned around but Todoroki stopped me. Wait, in his hand was the familiar bracelet he bought for me during the summer festival. Uh, that's... It broke during the battle at camp, I repaired it. He explained, may I? I nodded and he tied the bracelet to my wrist. My face felt slightly hot and once he finished, I hurriedly retracted my hand. L. Let's go. Todoroki smiled wryly and together we caught up with the rest of the class. Todoroki and I entered the building and we observed our new home in awe. The interior was huge. There's a big kitchen, a lounge with a big TV and many dining tables on the first floor. Aizawa Sensei explained that the above floors were where our rooms would be located. All the things we sent to UA have already been placed inside the room, and we just have to decorate them. Since it's already afternoon, we've been told to organize our things, and class will officially start tomorrow. Everyone was pretty excited at the thought of exploring the dorm. For the rest of the afternoon, we all went to decorate our rooms and meet on the first floor when it was dinner time. Speaking of dinner, I was stunned to see a large fridge, and when I opened it, there were tons of different ingredients. I volunteered on cooking duty but they have to wash the dishes, 
and everyone enthusiastically agreed. I utilized my cooking skills and made food for my friends. I know that it was a success as I watched my friends stuff their mouths with as much food as humanely possible. When everyone had finished eating, Mina suggested having the best room competition. Everyone except Bakugo decided to play the game, and we went up to each floor to observe our rooms. It's interesting to see everyone's taste in their decorations, such as Tokoyami's emo style room, Koda's animal friendly room, and Midoriya's all might obsession room. Sato also baked a delicious cake for the girls, and it was really good. However, the boys complained that we girls weren't showing them our rooms. Hearing their complaints, we nodded and brought them to our floor. Everything was going well until we arrived at my room. I forgot that there's something in there that should be kept to the utmost secrecy. As soon as Mina's hand grabbed the doorknob, I body flickered in front of her and blocked the door. Sorry, but I can't let you guys in. I said with panic. I remembered that I had brought my manga drawing materials and manuscripts as I planned to work on the Demon Slayer volumes while living in UA. What's wrong, Achiha-chan? Midoriya asked from the back. N nothing. But I can't show it to you guys. I replied. At this point, everyone's starting to get suspicious of what's behind the door. And they're demanding to know what's inside. Fine. Just give me a minute. I said and used Kamui to phase through the door. I grabbed all the papers on the desk and shoved them into my closet. It was pretty unstable as I threw them in. However, with a loud thud, the closet door exploded open, and all the pages started flying everywhere. I could hear my friends approaching my door, and I used Kamui to suck all the pages in. I sighed in relief as I wiped the blood off my face from the Kamui. All my friends went in and started suspiciously investigating my room. Inside there's my usual bed my studying desk with an office chair. It looks like a normal room except for the possible tens to hundred of plush toys stacked around the place and a vast weapons rack with many sharp weapons placed on it. These plushies were from back then when I was still a child. I can't have the heart of throwing these things away. Seeing that my room was nothing like usual except for the rows of weapons and plushies, they became confused. I sighed in relief, but things never went as planned. Hey Achiha-chan, what's this? Hagakure asked as she pointed at a book in the corner of the room wedged between a plush elephant and a crow. Before I could stop her, Hagakure had picked it up and opened it. She screamed in shock and everyone immediately crowded around her. Oi, this isn't this the popular demon slayer? Kaminari asked. What volume is this? Why haven't I heard of it? Hiroshima commented. Why do you have this Kichan? Volume 14 wasn't even out yet. Mina asked. Everyone brought their gaze toward me, seeing that it was too late to hide anything. I tried to give an excuse but there's one thing you should know. I'm a pretty bad liar. Obviously, they don't really buy it, I sighed and told them the truth, because I'm the one who wrote Demon Slayer. It took a few seconds for them to process what I said. What? They all yelled. Your sweet little princess? They asked in unison. Hearing my cringy alias, I winced and nodded looking at the floor in embarrassment. Soon they all started laughing at me. My Oniai-chan picked the name, not me. I desperately tried to defend myself, but it was not working. I started to get teary-eyed from the teasing. Fine. I won't publish the newest volume this month then. I shouted loudly. Immediately, their faces became pale. Isn't that a bit far, Achiha-chan? Kirishima said and my friends nodded. Hmph. I pouted and turned my back on them. Please forgive us. Everyone instantly bowed at a perfect 90 degrees angle. Seeing my friend's guilty looks, I sighed. Fine, but don't mention that name again. I demanded my classmates quickly nodded, knowing what was at stake if they don't listen. All of them looked at each other in silence before crowding around me. Why did Ringo Kusan have to die? Why does Zenitsu-san have a sparrow? What's the backstory for demons? My classmates did a full-out interrogation, constantly asking questions about the story. I somehow managed to calm them down and told them they will find out in time. In the end, we decided that Sato has the best room and it's definitely not because of the cake he baked. That's how my first day living in Yue went out. Chapter 55 Special Move Next Day Kipiovi, today's the first day we're back in class after the summer holiday. Everything was usual for the first half of the day until, in the afternoon, Aizawa-sensei entered the classroom. 
The Provisional Hero License Exam will start in a week, Aizawa Sensei abruptly announced. Sensei, aren't we a bit early to be participating in the exam? Midoriya raised his hand and asked. Aizawa Sensei said that with the recent incidents, we have already gained enough experience to be able to participate. However, we will still need to get stronger. As soon as he finished his explanation, the door to our class opened, and Cementos, Ectoplasm, and Midnight entered. All three of them explained that today we would be creating our special moves, and they would be assisting us. Hearing this, all of us got pretty excited. We've been told to change into our hero costumes and meet them at Jim Gamma. Ten minutes later, we were all wearing our hero costumes, and the three pro heroes stood in front of us. Cementos placed both his hands on the ground, and a giant cement mountain appeared in the middle of the gym. Aizawa Sensei explained that Cementos would help create the training field, Midnight would give out advice, and Ectoplasm would create clones of himself to spar against. Aizawa Sensei said that we will be doing this for the rest of the day. This will continue until the start of the provisional license exam. We each went to find a secluded spot to create our special move when they finished speaking. Currently, I'm at one of the corners of the gym, surrounded by cement targets made by Cementos. While everyone was making their moves, I was pondering on what kind of super move I should create. A light bulb appeared on the top of my head, and I took out the scroll Oniai-chan gave me yesterday. Since I didn't have the time to read it last night, why not just do it now? I unveiled the scroll and was shocked by its content. Oniai-chan, you're the best. I praised my Oniai-chan in my mind. It took me a while to read through the entirety of the scroll, as I didn't want to miss anything. When I finished, I placed the scroll on the ground. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. I activated my Mangekyo Sharingan as my pupil became the shape of a flower. Sisen! I exclaimed and chakra coated my body. The chakra started to increase and took the shape of a rib cage. Since this is the first time I have ever used Sisenu, I can only form the rib cage, and I can't manifest other appendages, such as the arms and head. Surprisingly, it didn't use as much chakra as expected, but my whole body started to feel sore. There were also slight strains in my eyes, but that little pain was nothing I couldn't handle. Soon enough, I was forced to deactivate my Sisanu, and I sat on the ground, panting tiredly. The feeling was as if you had just finished an intense workout, and all your muscles were strained. When I fixed myself with medical jutsu, I got into a meditation position. Since I'm only able to summon the ribcage, I'm wondering if I'm able to manifest other parts of the Sisanu. I concentrated and held my right hand in the air as if reaching for something. Sisenu, I said and felt my chakra leaving my body once more. I slowly opened my eyes and glimpsed at my arm. Sure enough, there's a giant skeletal arm overlapping my own. The arm is light purple and anything it touches, I can feel it as if it's my hand contacting the object. This time, instead of feeling discomfort throughout my body, I can feel pain in my right arm. There was a small boulder made of cement in front of me. I reached for it with my Sisenu, grasped it and clenched my fist. I can feel the resistance from the boulder before it crumbles into pieces. Awesome! I continued to master my Sisanu for the rest of the day. After practicing this long, I think I had enough training to summon the whole skeletal form. Well, here goes nothing. I said to myself and summoned Susano once more. Thirpa Vishoto was standing on a giant pillar made by Cementos, heaven-piercing ice wall. He shouted and stomped the ground. A large glacier formed in front of him, destroying everything in its path. After the incident in the training camp, Shoto realized he was weak and needed to get stronger. He almost lost a friend and Shoto wished to never experience that again. An enormous roar sounded through the entire gym. Shoto glanced to his left and saw the upper body of a gigantic purple skeleton. He was shocked, and he quickly went toward whoever was behind it. A slash N. I know Sisanu doesn't roar, but it will be awesome if it does, right? When Shoto arrived, he was surprised to see Keed was the cause of it. The colossal skeleton swung its arm, and the surrounding cement structures were instantly destroyed. It then slammed its fist onto the ground, and large cracks appeared. Shoto was speechless, and he watches Keed unleashing utter destruction all around her. However, just as soon as the skeleton appears, it vanishes and Keed collapses. Shoto ran up to Keed to check if she was okay. Ow! Keed groaned as she lay face first on the ground. 
Shoto, are you all right? I just overstrained my body and can't move. But don't worry, I will be back up and running in no time. Keed replied. What was that thing? Shoto asked as he knelt next to her. That's my Sisanu pretty cool, right? Keed answered. It's like the same move as your brother, Shoto commented. Keed nodded in response, but she immediately winced in pain. At this moment, the school bell rang and Keed glanced at Shoto. A little help? Shoto nodded and gently picked her up into a princess carry. Thing. Keed said. No problem. Hey, Todoroki-kun. Let's both do our best and pass the provisional license exam together. Okay? Shoto smiled and nodded as he slowly brought Keed back to their dorm. Keed observed Shoto's face and without knowing, a small blush appeared and her heart started to beat a little faster than before. Chapter 56 Provisional Hero License Exam and New Challenger Approaching A week later, Kipovi for the past week, I have been training nonstop to master my first form of Sisanu. For the first few days, it always results in Todoroki carrying me back. However, I was finally to summon it and not collapse from the soreness. I also have been practicing with Todoroki, and we even developed some combined special moves. One of those attacks was pretty destructive, and we were reprimanded because it was too dangerous. Well, he scolded us for the attack being too hazardous. That doesn't mean we can't use it, right? Right? Don't worry. We're not going to use it anytime soon, though. Our class has arrived at the Tacoba National Stadium for our provisional hero license exam. We were all pretty nervous, but Aizawa Sensei encouraged us to do our best, and that by passing this exam, we will walk closer to the goal of being heroes. We nodded at his encouragement and quickly huddled, promising each other that we would all pass. At this moment, a tall young man with dark brown hair and black eyes interrupted us. Hello, my name is Anesa Yurashi. I'm from Shiketsu High School. It will be an honor to fight against the hero class of UA. And I wish you all the best of luck. He said with a loud voice. He bowed so passionately that his forehead smashed into the cement floor. Ah, uh, hi, Yutashikuen, I'm Kidachiha. I wish you the best of luck as well. I chirped happily. Third POV. Anesa raised his head when he heard a voice calling out to him. His eyes widened when he noticed Keed. In Anesa's mind, the only word that could describe Keed was simple, beautiful. Ah, your forehead's bleeding. Keed said with concern. She gently touched his forehead and healed his wound. Inesa was in a trance as he watched at what he assumed to be an angel in front of him. He quickly snapped out of his daze and knelt on one knee and grasped Keed's hands with his own. Keed was surprised by his action as he gazed at her with vigor and passion. Please go out with me. He shouted, attracting everyone else's attention. What? Students in class 1A yelled with shock. Hearing this, Keed froze. Not knowing how to respond, she looked at Anesa's face and saw that love hearts replaced Anesa's eyes. However, Anesa was suddenly pushed back. Todoroki-kun. Keed murmured with a confused tone as Shoto stood between her and Anesa. Leave her alone, Shoto demanded with a cold attitude. For some reason, Shoto felt irked by Anesa's action and he was also slightly angry. Before Shoto realized it, he was already standing in between the both of them. Anesa frowned. You're Endeavor's son, right? He asked. What about it, Shoto remarked. Your name, tell me. Inesa said as he pointed at Shoto. Shoto Todoroki. He responded calmly. Todoroki, I challenge you to a battle between men. Whoever failed this exam won't interfere with the winner. Inesa declared. Very well, Shoto instinctively replied. And Inesa nodded before walking back to his class. There was silence as everyone was astonished by what they had just witnessed. All the male students were impressed by Anesa's boldness, while the female students were watching with stars in their eyes at the new potential gossiping materials. Interfere with what? Keat has broken the silence and asked. Her friends just sighed and patted her shoulder. They were interrupted as the exam staff informed every student about changing into their hero costumes and going inside the stadium. When they finished changing, they were led into a big room with a stage at the front. A man walked onto the stage and introduced himself as Yakuma Romera of the Hero Public Safety Commission. He explained that there are 1,540 students here today, and only 100 will participate in the exam. So an elimination round will be conducted. The elimination round's simple. 
Everyone will be handed three targets they have to place on their bodies. They will then be given six balls to hit other people's targets. The targets will light up if they're hit, and you will be eliminated if the balls hit all three of your targets. Keep P over the staff each handed us three targets and six balls, and I placed the target on the left side of my waist and shoulders. Suddenly the walls inside the room started shaking, and the four walls collapsed. What greeted us was a vast field with different terrains such as a mountain, water, and urban-style battleground. As a class, we all went to a spot away from the other schools and reached a rocky terrain-like area. Everyone, we should stay together. Midoriya suggested, I'm going alone. I don't want liability, Bakugo shouted as he walked away. Hold up, Bakugo-san. Hiroshima and Karmanari yelled and chased after him. I will leave as well, my quirks are better if I'm on my own. Todoroki said, and he slid away with his ice in the opposite direction. You guy, Midoriya muttered in a disappointed tone. I will go after Todoroki-kun, I sighed. Suddenly, someone threw an orange ball toward one of Midoriya's targets at a fast speed. My Sharingan activated and time seemed to slow down. I instantly unsheathed my katana and slashed the ball in half before it reached him. Thanks, Stone. Midoriya was stunned that if I hadn't reacted a second earlier, he would have gotten hit. Stay on guard, everyone. I declared before leaving them. Todoroki had already gone pretty far, but I should be able to find him by following the ice trail. I reached a steel labyrinth area with pipes and pieces of machinery, and the ice trail stopped there. The ground started to shake, and I stumbled from the earthquake. This tremor must be from that guy's quirk. What's his name again? Oh well, time to find Todoroki-kun, and I muttered. If my anime knowledge was correct, my friends should survive so I don't have to worry about them. Third Piov, while Kid was looking for Shoto, in another place, Inesa was standing on top of a tall building looking down at multiple class students. He used his quirks and swept away all the balls the students were holding. I'm sorry, but you will have to be eliminated for me to win. He shouted and Inesa gathered the ball high in the air and used his wind to blast all of the balls toward the examinee. Before you know it, Inesa has single-handedly eliminated 120 students. He looked down and nodded with satisfaction before screaming at the sky. This is for Uchiha. He happily declared. Back to Keed. Achu. Was someone mentioning me? Keed mumbled to herself. Chapter 57. The Attack of the Power Rangers. Shoto Piovi. What the hell is wrong with me? Why did I accept that challenge? I was going to decline but I subconsciously agreed. What am I even not interfering with? Am I not allowed to talk with Uchiha anymore if I lose? I clenched my fists at the thought and my eyes widened as I stared at my clenched fist. What was happening to me? Why does just the idea of Uchiha get me so worked up? I always told myself not to let my emotions lose control, but seems like I have failed to do that. Whatever it was, I needed to get it all together and figure out the problem. Currently, I'm in a maze-like area with giant machinery, pipes and tanks filled with unknown liquids. I have separated from my class because I told my classmates that my quirk wouldn't work well in a group. But in reality, I just needed some alone time to clear my head. Bam! Shit! I exclaimed and an orange ball hit the target at my right shoulder. Two more balls were thrown at me, and I created an ice wall to block incoming projectiles. I was caught off guard and I'm furious at myself for letting it happen. I stared at where the attack came from, and ten students from an unknown school landed in front of me. They were dressed like ninjas and they each wore different colors like that show I watched as a child. A person dressed in a red-colored costume, who I assume was the leader, walked up to the front of their group. Aren't you pretty arrogant? Splitting off with your class. He taunted I stayed silent and shot a stream of fire at them. However, the fire was put out as water sprayed out of the hands of the blue shinobi. We're the students from Sijin High, and we will be the ones to defeat the second strongest person in the first year of UA Academy, the leader stated and hurled a hardware nut at me. The hardware nut suddenly enlarged to a gigantic size. I hurriedly dodged as the wall behind me exploded into pieces. I gritted my teeth and placed my hand on the ground. The floor was instantly covered with ice freezing all their feet in place. The leader flung more bolts and nails in my direction. I shot fire at it and tried to melt it, but it was useless and I barely moved out of the way in one piece. My tools were made out of tungsten, 
which means that it's resistant to extreme temperature. The Red Ninja boasted. Two yellow-colored shinobi smashed the icy floor with their fists and instantly shattered the ice, freeing their teammates. This is bad. I thought. My fire can be stopped by the water and mud and my ice can be easily destroyed with the yellow one's pure strength and that leader's item gigantification quirk. A stream of water was sent toward me and I used my fire to create a smoke screen. Seeing the opportunity, I retreated. After him, I sprinted as fast as I could, however, they quickly surrounded me before I could fully get away. My back was pressed against the wall, and I clicked my teeth in frustration. It's your own fault for being alone. Your participation in this hero license exam ends here. The student in red shouted. Who said that he's alone? I heard a familiar voice. A slim figure leaped over us and gracefully landed behind my opponents. Her black hair blew in the wind and her smile was as bright as ever. Sorry, Todoroki kun. It took me a while, but I finally found you. Uchiha said. Knowing Uchiha had arrived, my body relaxed. No matter what this strange emotion was sprouting within me, right now I'm glad that she was here. Where is that guy? I complained in my head. I thought I should be able to find Todoroki by now, but that's not the case. An announcement has already been made that 50 people have passed, so I'm running out of time. Boom, I heard a loud explosion in the distance, that must be where Todoroki Kuen is. I exclaimed and made my way toward the explosion. I landed on top of a small building and glanced down. There was Todoroki surrounded by people dressed like Power Rangers. I jumped and landed behind the group of Power Rangers. Sorry, Todoroki Kuen, it took me a while, but I finally found you. I smiled. Todoroki sighed in relief and I stared at our enemies. I could sense the uneasiness in their eyes. Don't worry, there's ten of us and two of them. The Red Power Ranger shouted in the most generic antagonist way possible. But like every story, it worked as the rest of their morale returned. We each take five? I suggested, and Todoroki nodded with a smile. Without hesitation, both of us charged at our competition. Third POV, unlike the students in Seijin, Keat fought like a true shinobi as she elegantly darted around her opponents. The student dressed in yellow charged at Keat and he swung his fist in a wild manner. Keat easily caught the massive fist with her palm and her Manjiku Sharingan manifested. She drained the strength of her adversary and the yellow shinobi went limp. He fell onto his knees and with Kate's abnormal strength, she easily lifted him into the air. With a smooth motion, Keat tossed his body toward his friends and they collided forming a weird bundle. Ki didn't give them time to recover from her attack, and she uses Kamui to teleport behind them. She unsheathed her katana and with a precise swing, the belts of their hero costumes were slashed and their pants fell onto the floor. The Sijin students blushed and desperately covered their underwear but were immediately met with a swift kick to the face. Ki whistled and watched her handiwork. The group of students was unconscious, and there was an imprint of her foot on each of their faces. On Shoto's side, things weren't also going well for his opposition either. With his weakness gone, Shoto gets more freedom and he uses his quirks to defeat his foe. He launched an ice pillar toward the red shinobi. The Seijin student dodged and grunted with frustration. The pillar hit a gas tank and some unknown gas started spewing out. Shoto suddenly had an idea and he called Ki to regroup. Ki trusted Shoto very much, so she doesn't need to question his decision. She arrived at his side as the unconscious student began to recover one by one. The Seijin students surrounded them and they were highly cautious of what tricks Shoto had on his sleeves. Before anyone could react, Shoto aimed his flames at the gas tank and a massive eruption blasted everyone away. As soon as the ignition happened, Shoto grabbed Keed by the waist and pulled her close as he summoned a thick dome made of ice, protecting both of them from the detonation. Keed was surprised as her head leaned on his chest. There was silence except for each other's breathing. Keat's body stiffened as she felt Shoto's tough chest on her face. She hesitantly glanced at Shoto and her body felt hot. Shoto was still tightly embracing her and she blushed. Um, Todoroki Kuen. Keat muttered in a high pitched voice. Hearing Keat's voice, Shoto's mind went blank and he froze like a statue. He hesitantly glanced down and noticed Keat was blushing profusely. Her body trembled and Shoto hurriedly let go. They stood side by side in awkward silence until Shoto determined that it was safe to leave. 
Kiva Vishoto dispelled his ice dome, and we went to search for the Power Rangers. They were all over the place with their eyes spinning in circles and I muttered a quiet apology when I placed the balls on each of their targets, eliminating them from the match. I glanced at Shoto who was doing the same thing and I felt the blush returning to my face. The sudden hug was still vivid in my mind and I could clearly hear his beating heart. Kidachiha passed. Shoto Todoroki passed. The robotic announcement snapped me out of my daze and I visibly relaxed. Todoroki and I walked to the waiting room. There were already many people there and we found two empty seats and sat next to each other. Sorry, Todoroki muttered out of the blue. Oh, huh, for what? I asked. Todoroki explained that he should have warned me before pulling me into his arms. I averted my gaze and bit my lips. It's fine. But, no really, I interrupted him. Todoroki-kun didn't have any ill intentions and he wanted to protect me, right? Todoroki nodded and I smiled. Then that's okay besides, I muttered quietly. For some reason I felt more comfortable if Todoroki's the one that did it. Todoroki smiled wryly and we waited in silence. Without knowing, our distance have closed compared to before. Chapter 58 Rescuing Operation Kipovi, hey everyone, I'm glad that you all passed. I chirped to the rest of my class. Of course, how will I lose to these weaklings? Bakugo arrogantly boasted. Luckily, all my friends survived the preliminary round without much trouble. We all celebrated, but Siro said something shocking. Hey Midoriya-san, what were you doing with that naked woman during the preliminary? He asked. Hearing this, all of us stared at Midoriya with dumbfounded expressions. I completely forgot about that part. That must be when Toga stole some of his blood. I need to do something about this. I didn't hear you correctly. May you repeat what you said, Dekakuen? Ochako asked while unleashing a demonic aura. Mina and I felt it instantly, and both of us tried to restrain her. There must be a reason behind it. Mina whispered. Yeah, calm down, Ochako-chan, or else Midoriya-kun will find out that you have a crush on him. I whispered in the other ear. What are you talking about? Me and Dekika. Ochako panicked and her face turned red. We will talk about this later. I quietly said. And we all listened to Midoriya's explanation. Midoriya desperately defended himself, saying it had something to do with her quirk. We eventually believed him since we all know Midoriya wasn't the person who would do such things. Oi Todoroki, I want to wish you luck because I will be trying my best to win our competition. I turned around and saw Yurashi, Inesa, approaching Todoroki and reaching for a handshake. Honestly, what are you guys competing about? Nobody will tell me. I whined and appeared between the two of them. Sorry, Achiha, but this is a battle between men. Yurashi proclaimed. I said with disappointment and pouted. Yurashi chuckled and patted my head. I swear I saw a tick mark on Todoroki's forehead. Or were my eyes playing tricks on me? Suddenly I recalled something that I wanted to ask Yurashi. By the way, yurashi kuen have you considered going to Yue instead of Shiketsu High? Since Yurashi no longer has a reason to dislike Endeavor anymore, I was curious about what happened. Well, Yurashi smiled awkwardly and averted my gaze. Third POV flashback. What do you mean we're moving? Inesa shouted in shock. We told you two weeks ago that your father got a job in the west of Japan, remember? I have constantly reminded you about it. Also, didn't you notice that we packed our things about a week ago? Inesa's mother said with a deadpan expression. I was too focused on the UA recommendation exam, and I haven't noticed anything. Inesa exclaimed. Inesa had utterly forgotten that his family was moving houses. What's worse was they were moving toward the west of Japan, which was a completely different direction to Yue, located in the east. Now it was his mother who was shocked. Don't tell me you went. Humph, of course. How could I give up on this opportunity? Inesa replied proudly. Don't worry, mother. I will figure something out. Hearing Inesa's confidence, his mother smiled wryly and nodded. A day later. Principal Nizu, sir, unfortunately, I have to forego my invitation to you, Inesa said while bowing at Nizu in his office. Inesa then explained the reason for foregoing the acceptance of UA. Nizu chuckled understanding Inesa's situation. He took out a document from his desk and wrote something down. Since you're going to the West, how about going to Shiketsu High? Nizu suggested. 
Shiket Sahai. Inesa repeated. Nizu nodded. Yes, it's another Hero Academy located in the west of Japan. As much as I hate to admit it, it has the same prestige as UA. I know the principal there personally, and if you show him this form, you will likely be accepted into the Hero course. However, you may still be tested once more. Inesa gently held the document in front of him as if it was the most fragile thing in the world. Thank you so much. He shouted as his forehead smashed onto the floor from his bowing. Nizu cackled at his behavior before shooing Inesa away. Kids these days. Flashback end. Give of wow, Principal Nizu sure is pretty nice. Huh, I commented hearing Yurashi's story. Yurashi nodded. Then I got accepted into Shiketsu High. And I don't regret it for even a second. Suddenly the door to the waiting room opened. And the man from the hero committee walked in. He told us to watch the big screen in the waiting room. The screen revealed the battlefield we were just on, but instead it was wholly destroyed. He explained that villains attacked the city, and the final round would be a rescue operation. Some civilian volunteers would be acting like victims. We must rescue them and bring them to the designated safe area. We will earn or lose points depending on how well we did. When the explanation finished, the walls in the waiting room collapsed once again. Together as a class this time, we went to the nearest area affected by the villains. Third POV Class 1A eventually found an injured child next to a broken building. The child cried that his grandpa had been crushed under the debris, and Izuku had a pitying look. The child immediately pointed it out, to everyone's surprise, and deducted points for Izuku. He then lectured the class and told them about hiding their emotions so the victims would feel reassured. Before the child could say more, Keith's body flickered in front of him, gently picking him up. Don't worry. Everything will be okay now. She comforted the child and applied medical ninjutsu. Keith then held her hand towards the pile of debris. A giant purple skeletal arm formed around her and she carefully lifted the massive piece of debris, revealing an elderly man lying on the ground. Itakuen, check on the injured man. If he's okay, then follow me. We will bring these two to the safe area. Keith ordered. Roger. Tenya agreed and went to check on the old man. Good job. X2 immediately. The child and the old man stopped acting and exclaimed while pointing at Keed. This was exactly how you should act. The child complimented. Keed happily nodded. Go find more people that needed help, Itakuen, and I will meet up with you guys. Keed said to the rest of her friends. She picked the child up before dashing away while Tenya followed close behind. Class 1A were in awe, Keed's action filled them with determination, and together, they went to find more people to save. Keed POV, once I reached the safe area, I set the child down. Everything will be safe now. The boy nodded and gave me a thumbs up. I believe you will be a great hero one day. Think. I felt embarrassed being complimented. Kaboom. A gigantic hole was made at the side of the stadium. My eyes brightened up. Remembering the event in the provisional license arc. Ah, this must be where Gang Orca and his sidekicks will act as villains. I thought excitedly. I gazed at the gaping hole with anticipation. Soon enough, a couple of dozen people started coming out. But wait, they're wearing different costumes than I remember. They're all wearing black clothing, a gray flak jacket, metal arm guards, gloves, and swords strapped to their backs. The most noticeable features were the animal-styled porcelain masks. Are those umboos? I muttered in disbelief. My eyes widened when I saw the person standing at the back of the group, Oniai-chan. He was wearing his Akatsuki costume, but this time he also wore an animal mask, and I could see his bright red Sharingan through the eye holes. Villains have appeared. Heroes must suppress them as well as carry out the rescue operation. A calm voice sounded from the speakers. Third POV Keed activated her lightning chakra mode and sprinted toward her enemies. The villains unsheathed their swords. Keed leaped high in the air, Raitan. Reika Haidofuki no jutsu, she said and fired multiple bolts of lighting out of her hands. The jutsu strikes around ten villains, and they fall to the floor, paralyzed. She landed in the middle of the gang of villains and unsheathed her blade as Keed started to disarm and knock out the enemies around her. In the back of the group, Itachi was watching his litter sister fight with a proud expression. Itachi, Keith's pretty strong now, Shursway commented. Itachi nodded. Go and stop her. 
Try not to get your ass kicked, Shursway chuckled before using his extreme speed and arriving in front of Keed. With a swift motion, he pulled out his blade and swung downward, and Keed instantly reacted and blocked. Yo, Keechan, Shursway said as he took off his mask. Never thought you guys would be in the test, Keed replied. Well, knowing your brother, he immediately agreed to participate, knowing that he will be to meet you here. He sighed tiredly Keed smiled at her cousin and entered her stance, go after the civilians, I will deal with her, Shursway shouted. His companions nodded before leaving Keed alone. She tried to stop them from running away, but Shursway intercepted her blade. Sorry, I can't let you do that, Shursway said with his usual carefree attitude. Keed created distance between them and her Sharingan slowly turned from the three Tomo to a shape of a flower as she activated her Manjiku Sharingan. Shursway grinned and he also activated his Sharingan. Dabushosh the two dashed towards each other and crossed blades. Chapter 59 Jinjutsu Shore is Annoying Third POV Keed and Shursway dash around the battlefield. Shursway with his extreme speed and Keed with her lightning chakra mode. However, Shursway has the advantage as Keed could barely catch up with Shursway's speed. Every time they clash, metal striking metal echoes throughout the stadium. Keed's hands started to numb with each attack from Shursway's blade. Shursway was terrifying because he never needed to slow down to aim his attack thanks to his Sharingan. Due to that fact, Shursway can generate an absurd amount of force before attacking his enemies. Fortunately for Keed, without Shursway realizing it and with every engagement, Keed uses her Daikoku to sap away a tiny amount of Shursue's strength to not arouse suspicion. When she drained enough strength, Keed purposely slowed down and deactivated her lighting chakra mode to lure Shursue into a false sense of security. It worked and Shursue stopped his attack as well. Seems like I used more energy than I expected. Shursue muttered and he flexed his fingers. Keed smirked, knowing what had actually happened. All well seems like I need to use my trump card. Without hesitation, Shursue appeared in front of Keed. He swung his sword and Keed hurriedly blocked. She fell onto one knee from the impact as spiderweb like cracks formed where she was standing. Keed immediately stopped hiding her strength as she slowly stood up and further boosted the chakra into her limbs. Shursue was shocked by her sudden increase in power, and he decided to use his ultimate trump card. He locked his blade on Keed's katana and his pupils changed from the standard three tomo into a pinwheel. Keed was stunned and she tried to escape with Kamui but fate was sealed with a single word. Stop! Keed's body completely froze, and she was forced to stare into Shursue's eyes. Within a few seconds, everything went pitch black. Shursue warily let go as Keed dropped her katana. Sorry cousin, but it seems like I won this one. He said while smiling wryly as he was going to hand chop Keed's neck to knock her out entirely. Suddenly, a huge purple ribcage surrounded Keed's body, and Shursue winced from how tough it was as his hand hit the ribcage. While even under Jinjutsu, out of bodily instinct, Keed subconsciously activated her Sisanu to protect herself. Shursue stabbed the ribcage with his sword, but it barely made a dent, and he clicked his teeth, seeing that his sword was now slightly chipped. He sighed and shrugged his shoulders, trying all the other methods he could think of to destroy Keed's ultimate defense. Kipo, where the hell am I? I screamed in frustration. I found myself in a long hallway with probably hundreds of doors. I guessed that one of these doors would be an exit. It's this one here. I opened the first door, but it revealed an empty room. Okay, how about this one? I exclaimed and slammed open the second door. Third's time the charm. Fourth time the charm. Fifth time the charm. Sixth, seventh, eighth. I grumbled with annoyance. Shursakuan, you better watch out. When I come back, you will regret it. I screeched while shaking my fist at the ceiling. Countless doors later. Here's Keed. FBI, open up. Was one of these doors even the exit? I sighed tiredly at the thought and lazily opened the next door, but instead of the familiar empty room, there seemed to be a ghoulish creature sitting in the corner. It slowly turned around and stared at me with its sunken eyes, and my body jolted. He sorry to bother you, ghoul san. I chuckled while closing the door. Immediately a fist burst through the door and turned the doorknob. The ghoul emerged while observing me like I was prey. The ghoul was freakishly tall with long arms and white skin, 
and it was also very skinny like a skeleton wearing a skin suit. It growled, and without hesitation, I sprinted away. K-Y-A-A. Uh, I screamed and ran as fast as I could. Damn you, Shursue k -E. I yelled at the top of my lungs as the monster chased after me. Suddenly twists and turns started to manifest in the hallway, but with every turn, another one of those ghouls appeared. After ten minutes of running, I finally noticed a door that seemed different from all the others. I ran towards it, didn't think twice about it, and charged through the entryway. There was a blinding light, and everything became blank. Third POV, what was this broken ability? Shursue groaned while staring at Keed Sisanu. He stabbed what was left of his weapon once more, but the Sisanu vanished and Keed grabbed him by the wrist. I'm back, miss me, Shursue Kuen? Keed said while smiling, but her smile didn't reach her eyes. Sorry. Shursue gulped with a pale face. Ignoring his apology, Keed started beating the crap out of him. That was terrifying, she yelled with tears in her eyes. Shursue's face now looked just as bad as the boys in class, one be back in training camp, and Keed dropped him to the floor. I may have gone a bit overboard. Keed smiled awkwardly while scratching the side of her cheek. Shursue didn't respond as he lay on the floor, glaring at his cousin. I'm sorry, Shursue next time we meet, I will treat you to my cooking. Shursue's eyes lit up before groaning. You better. Itachi Pov earlier. I smiled and watched the battle between Keed and Shursue. Watching the fight, I can tell how hard she has been training. I'm incredibly proud of her and I remember she was still just a child as if it was just yesterday. I immediately signed up when I heard that the hero committee needed heroes to act as villains. There were two reasons, the first was to meet my beloved sister again and the other was, a colossal iceberg appeared before me, and I destroyed it with a single punch. Ah, you're here. I said to Enji's son who was standing before me. Your name is Shoto, right? I asked. He was bewildered but nodded to my question. Good. The hero committee told me not to go all out. However, that doesn't mean I will make this easy. I shouted and threw two kunai at him. Like all our weapons, the edges were rounded so they won't cut into the flesh. Unfortunately, it will still hurt pretty bad. A small ice wall blocked the kunai, and Shoto then removed the ice and fired a stream of fire out of his palm. I held out my new hand to block the attack. I have to admit, this new arm of mine was better than I expected. It's rigid, flexible, and powerful. Surprisingly, before the fire reached me, a massive gust of wind blew it away. This will be my fight. Another boy yelled and glided towards me from the sky. I tilted my head to the side, and his foot soared past my head. I jumped away to create distance between the two. What are you doing? My attack could have hit him. Shoto shouted. I won't lose our competition. So get out of my way. My name is Anesa Yurashi, and my pro hero name is Gale Force. I will be the one to defeat you, villain. Anesa declared. Shoto looked at him with annoyance. Seeing these two bickerings, I frowned. Who the hell would be arguing in a situation like this? And also, why do I have the urge to beat up that Anesa boy even more than Shoto? Shoto launched an ice spike, and Anesa shot a wind blade, both attacks going toward me quickly. However, like before, both attacks collided and cancelled each other out. What are you doing? X2 the two students yelled at each other. You just wanted to hog all the glory but you shall be the one to lose this challenge. Inesa declared. Shoto clicked his teeth and he stared back. I sighed. How do you have the nerves to call yourselves heroes? I muttered Katango Kaku no Jetsu. I expel a giant fireball between them. Shoto and Inesa dodged, and I immediately flickered in front of Inesa and grabbed him by the neck. I threw him towards Shoto and both boys crashed into each other. I walked up to them and lifted both heroes by the collar. Seems like your participation in this exam ends here, I said with a cold tone. Chapter 60 Realization Third POV Itachi calmly lifted the two young heroes and coldly stared at them. Shoto and Inesa tried their hardest to break free, but they were not strong enough, and the boys could only glare at Itachi. Try again next time. Itachi said and prepared to slam Shoto and Inesa onto the ground, incapacitating them. Suddenly Itachi dropped the heroes and jumped backward as two kunai stabbed them into the ground where he was previously standing. Keed arrived, and she glanced at Shoto and Inesa. 
Come on, you two, you can do this. You wanted to become heroes, don't you? Keat encouraged the two boys. I thought sure Sway would last longer. Itachi helplessly sighed, and he smiled wryly. Keat grinned and activated her sisanu. Her body was covered with her own chakra as an upper body of a giant skeletal figure was formed. It roared and brought its fists towards Itachi. Itachi dodged, and his grin widened. You have already got to this stage of Sisanu? Impressive. He complimented her. Orange chakra wrapped around Itachi's body, and his own skeletal Sisanu appeared. The two giant monsters wrestled with each other. Shoto and Inesa tried to help Keed, but Itachi's minions surrounded the two heroes. This time they worked together. Shoto blasted Itachi's sidekicks with his fire while Inesa maneuvered the flames around the battlefield with his wind. Suddenly Keed's Sisanu flew over Shoto and Inesa's heads as she was tossed away by Itachi. Keed slowly got back up and grumbled. Shoto a little help? Keed asked. Shoto nodded and remembered one of the combined moves they created before the exam. He slammed his hand onto the ground as he encased Keed and her Sisanu into a colossal iceberg. Itachi frowned. He charged and tried to interrupt Shoto from whatever he was doing. The giant ice shattered and Keed's Sisanu emerged. The Sisanu emerged in its new form. Now it donned an armor made of ice and wielded a massive hammer. Itachi cursed as Keed swung the hammer at her brother. Itachi raised his arms to block, and he grunted from the impact. Itachi looked up and noticed Keed smirking at him. He smiled back and Keed swung the hammer once again, but this time he easily caught the head of the hammer with his hand. Keed's expression while watching this scene can be described as, I messed up. Immediately Itachi's Sisanu clenched his fist, and Keed's weapon was destroyed. Itachi was much more experienced using his Sisanu, and he unleashed a barrage of punches, and Keed's armor started to break away. With a final punch, Itachi demolished Keed's Sisanu, and she screamed as she was launched away. Inesa caught her, and Keed thanked him for his action. Inesa set her down and Keed unsheathed her katana. Thanks to her training, she can still fight after using the Sisanu and her body starts to heal from the muscle pain. Itachi also deactivates his Sisanu and smiled playfully at Keed. Keed used Kemui to teleport behind Itachi, and she slashed at him, but Itachi parried as the two Uchiha engaged in an all-out duel. After the first spar with her brother, Keed copied her brother's fighting style, and since Itachi was going easy, Keed managed to keep him at bay. Shoto and Inesa helped whenever the opportunity arose, firing ice and wind at their opponent which forced Itachi to dodge while also paying attention to Keed. Slowly, he was getting pushed into a corner and Itachi glanced around the battleground. Shursue was still down and out. The majority of the students had arrived and were fighting his sidekicks. An ice wall shot out of the ground behind Itachi. He tried to escape by dashing to the side but faced a massive gust of wind from Inesa. Itachi was trapped and could only move forward where Keed was awaiting him. Keed built up chakra in her fist and threw a punch at her brother. Itachi blocked with his mechanical arm, and a massive shockwave was generated, destroying everything in their surroundings. The small explosion blasted Shoto and Inesa away as cracks ran up from Itachi's metal hand to his shoulder. A loud audible voice echoed throughout the stadium's speakers. All citizens have been safely evacuated. The provisional hero license exam has officially ended. Everyone stopped fighting and the students sighed in relief. Itachi was caught off guard as Keed stopped her attack and tackled him. Keed hugged him tightly and refused to let go. While living in the UA dorms, she often talks with her family through her phone, but it's not the same as actually seeing them. Itachi smiled and patted her head. You need to change back to your uniform or else you will be late. Keed shook her head, unwilling to leave. Itachi chuckled, and after a bit more persuasion, she reluctantly let go. Itachi's smile still remains as he watches the leaving figure of her sister. Sorry, Uchiha-san. The students were harder than expected. Itachi's sidekicks walked up to him and apologized. They're pretty strong this year, Itachi said and he glanced at his metal arm. He gently touched it, and the arm crumbled into pieces. However, there were some that still immature. He frowned while recalling Shoto and Inesa. Let's go. We're leaving. Someone carry sure sway, Itachi said and stared at his cousin, who was still beaten up on the floor. Of twenty minutes later, when I finished changing, I tried to search for my Oni-chan. However, 
Seems like he had already left. I didn't even have a chance to say goodbye. We gathered at the stadium center and watched the big screen in front of us. A list of names appeared, and we watched with anxiety. I relaxed when I spotted my name on the screen. My friends celebrated as well when they saw their own names. But I don't see Todoroki, Bakugo, and Yurashi's names. Their face had grim expressions. Yurashi walked to Todoroki and bowed. I'm sorry for making you fail. He apologized. It's okay. Todoroki accepted his apology. There were other people with depressed expressions, but they soon lightened up hearing that they still got a chance. Those who fail can attend a special training course and get a license. Wow, that's great, Todoroki-kun. That means you still got a chance. I cheered and patted his back. Suddenly, Yurashi held my hands. Uchiha-chan, because of my incompetence, I don't deserve your love. He shouted. Before I could respond, he was dragged away by his classmates. Third POV as the exam ended, Himiko, who was disguising herself as Kami, called Tamura with a smile. I got it, Himiko said proudly and observed the small vial of Azuka's blood. Good job. Tamura's voice said through the phone suddenly. A slim figure appeared in front of Himiko. She immediately reacted as she pulls out her knife and attacked the stranger. The slim figure dodged and stared at Himoko with its blood red eyes. It moved behind her and grabbed hold of Himiko's wrist. The stranger took the vial of blood before throwing it down the street. With a smash, the vial of blood exploded and all its content poured into the sewer. In a fit of rage, Himiko stabbed the person in the heart with her knife, but instead of dying, the figure burst into a cloud of smoke, vanishing from the scene. Later that night, Shoto was lying on the top of his bed. He felt a vibration and took out his phone from his back pocket. With a few clicks of a button, Enji and Ray appeared on the screen. Hey mom, hey dad. Shoto greeted. Shoto, are you okay? We heard what happened, but don't worry, we know you will pass next time. Ray encouraged and she gave him a thumbs up. Thanks. Shoto responded. Is there something wrong? Ray worriedly asked when she noticed her son's downcast expression. Mom, Dad, can I ask you a question? Ray, sure, what is it? For a while now, whenever I was with my friend, I felt my face heat up, and my heart started beating faster than normal. Enji and Ray's eyes widened as they looked at each other. How should we explain this, Enji muttered. While all this was happening, in the one a lounge room, the girls were having a fun conversation on the couch. Wow, I can't believe we passed the test, Momo said and held her hero license with a satisfied smile. By the way, tell me what you two mean I like Dekha. Ochako exclaimed and pointed at her two best friends. You like Midoriyakuen, don't you? Keat asked. Yeah, but as a friend. Ochako countered. You sure? Mina said, and Ochako's face became red. Everyone looked at Ochako with surprise, and she was getting increasingly embarrassed. D don't L look at me. What about Kichan? She shouted. And what about me? Keith said with confusion. You harbor feelings for Todoroki kuen don't you? Ochako said. There's nothing between us. Keith squealed as she blushed. Honestly, just get together already, Mina said. And the rest of the girls nodded. In fact, everyone in class 1A could tell what was happening, and it wasn't even a surprise at this point. Really, we're just friends. Keith yelled as her hand slapped the table. Okay, sure, Mina said, unconvinced as she got up from her seat. Where are you going? Tsuyu asked. Oh, me? I'm going to confess my love to Shoto, of course. Mina replied with a mischievous tone. Sit back down. Mina heard a cold voice behind her. She turned around and Keed was staring at her. Keed Sharingan was spinning rapidly as Mina's body ignored her own command and sat back down on the couch. All the girls smirked at Keed who now had just realized what she did. I don't like him okay. Sure, sure, Keith's friends responded nonchalantly. It's nothing to feel embarrassed about, Mina explained. You will naturally feel that way since the two of you have been spending a lot of time together. Keith wanted to deny Mina but she couldn't. She think through her time at UA and realized that Mina was right. Ashido-san is right, it's normal for you to be conscious of Todoroki-san, who's the opposite sex, Tu added. Keith's blush deepened and she covered her face. Do I really like Todoroki Kuen? She thought and her body heated up instantly. Finally can't take it anymore. I'm going to bed. Keith yelled and teleported away. Back in Shoto's room, 
Things weren't any better and his parents told him why he was feeling this way. Ah, my little Shoto's in love. Ray said happily and hugged Enji's shoulder. Enji lightly coughed and Ray quickly snapped out of her fantasy. Don't worry Shoto, don't be afraid. Tell her how you really feel. If you got rejected, your father and I will be here for you. Ray comforted her son. She elbowed Enji in the stomach and he nodded along to his wife's words. The call soon ended and Shoto groaned as he buried his face into his pillow. There's no way I like her, right? Shoto asked himself but his fast-beating heart answered his question. What if she doesn't feel the same way? He's scared. Shoto really doesn't know what to do if Kid rejected him. But even with these fears, he wanted to give it a shot. But before that, he needed to work up the courage to say those things first. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part 4. Peace!